Hello, son. It's the end of another week. A week full of scary and creepy horror stories that will make your skin crawl. In tonight's multiple episode, I prepared different horror stories ranging from police and Native American all to the park ranger and deep woods horror stories. Hope you enjoy it. As a young rookie police officer named Johnny, I had seen my fair share of strange things on the job, but nothing could have prepared me for what I was about to face in that national park. When I got the call about a murder there, I didn't expect it to be anything out of the ordinary, but as I arrived at the scene, it became clear that something was amiss. The victim had been torn apart in a way that no human could have done. I started to piece together the clues and realized that the only logical explanation was that the killer was a Bigfoot type of creature. The corpse had unusual marks and paw prints on it too big to be an ordinary animal. Also, I had heard stories of Bigfoot sightings in the area, but I had never believed in them until now. As I started to investigate further, I began to see signs of the creature's presence all around me. Large footprints in the mud, broken branches, and disturbed earth. I knew I had to find the creature or allow him to find me. Unintentionally, I found a clue on the corpse that led me to a local cave. There was a certain kind of flower on the corpse, only found on a part of park where there is a cave. I didn't tell anyone about my discovery. I decided to venture alone there, so I went there. I made my way inside and found nothing. Strange. I couldn't shake the feeling that I was being watched. Suddenly a massive figure loomed out of the darkness. It was a Bigfoot and it was angry. The creature tackled me and I tried to fought back as best I could. But it was no use. The Bigfoot was too strong and too fast. As I lay on the ground I realized that I, I might not make it out of this cave alive. I tried to run away, but the creature was too fast. It grabbed me by the arm and lifted me off the ground, its hot breath on my face. I closed my eyes and braced for the end, but it didn't come. Fortunately, the Bigfoot heard something behind him. I didn't, but I was sure he had some superior hearing abilities. It was something far away that interested him more than killing me, I guess. He put me down and vanished into the woods. I was shaken and confused. I returned to a park ranger station, tried to explain to people there what happened. They mocked me. They said that Bear attacked a young camper and that they wrote it off as an accident. I tried to persuade them that that wasn't true, but they just said that I smoked some weird shit and that I'll get fired for it. What the F? I was a park ranger at an American national park known for its lush forests and towering mountains. The stillness of the night was only broken by the occasional hoot of an owl and the rustling of leaves and the gentle breeze. I was on patrol in my jeep, scanning the surroundings for any signs of danger or disturbance. As I drove down a remote road, I suddenly saw a light in the distance. I decided to check it out. As I got closer, I realized that the light was moving, almost as if it was alive. I couldn't explain it, but I had a feeling that something was off. I got out of my jeep and approached the source of the light, my hand instinctively reaching for my flashlight. To my shock, what I saw was a ghostly figure, its translucent body glowing eerily in the moonlight. The ghost was dressed in tattered clothes and had a wicked grin on its face. I felt a chill run down my spine as the ghost suddenly burst into a fit of evil laughter. I tried to talk to the ghost to find out what it wanted, but it just disappeared into the woods, leaving me confused and scared. I quickly jumped into my jeep and drove back to the park headquarters, unsure of what had just happened and what the ghost wanted from me. The next morning I couldn't shake off the feeling of unease from the night before. I told my colleagues about the ghost, but they didn't believe me. They thought I was just imagining things, but I knew what I saw. I decided to investigate further and started to gather information about the history of the park. 
I found out that the park was built on sacred Native American land and that there had been several reports of ghost sightings over the years. Days went by and the ghost continued to haunt me. I would see it at night, always laughing and taunting me. I couldn't sleep or eat and my colleagues were starting to become worried about my mental state. One night I finally couldn't take it anymore. I grabbed my flashlight and headed back to the spot where I saw the ghost. I called out to it, demanding to know what it wanted from me. Suddenly, the ghost appeared, its form becoming more solid. It told me that the park was built on sacred land and that it was angry that its resting place had been disturbed. The ghost demanded that I help it put the spirits of its ancestors to rest by performing a sacred ceremony. I knew that I had to do what the ghost asked, and I worked with local Native American leaders to perform the ceremony. After the ceremony was complete, the ghost finally disappeared, and I was able to sleep peacefully for the first time in weeks. From that day on, I made sure to respect the land and the spirits that inhabited it, and I never saw the ghost again. But I will never forget that frightening encounter and the lesson it taught me about the importance of respecting the dead and the land they call home. However, my colleagues and I started to notice strange occurrences happening around the park. Trees would shake for no reason, and strange whispers could be heard in the wind. Some of the visitors even reported seeing ghostly apparitions in the woods. We soon realized that the ghost was not the only one who was angry. There were others who had also been disturbed by the park's construction, and they were seeking revenge. One night I received a distress call from one of the camping sites. When I arrived, I found that several tents had been destroyed and several people were missing. I searched the surrounding area and eventually stumbled upon a clearing where I saw the ghostly apparition standing together, holding the missing people captive. I realized that I had to do something to stop them, but I was only one person against many angry spirits. I remembered the ceremony that I performed with the Native American leaders and knew that I had to perform it again this time with the help of my colleagues. We gathered together and performed the ceremony, calling upon the spirits of the land to restore balance and peace. To our surprise, the ghostly apparitions disappeared, and the missing people were released unharmed. From that day on, the park was at peace, and the spirits that had once haunted it were finally at rest. I learned that sometimes the things that scare us the most can teach us the greatest lessons, and that the land we live on must be respected and honored. I was just an average hiker out for a day hike in the National Park. I heard the legends of the Wendigo, but I never thought I would come face to face with one. It all happened so fast. One moment I was admiring the beauty of the woods, and the next I was being tackled by a creature unlike any I would ever seen before. It was tall and thin, with matted fur and glowing eyes. It had elongated fingers that ended in sharp claws. Its mouth was wide and gaping, revealing razor-sharp teeth. The creature dragged me deeper into the woods, away from the trail. I struggled and fought, but it was no use. It was too strong. It pinned me to the ground and began to feast on my flesh. I remember thinking that this was it. This was the end. And then everything went black. When I woke up, I was in the ranger station. Park Ranger Harold was sitting next to me. He was the one who had found my body and brought me back to civilization. You're lucky to be alive, he said. I found you just in time, but I'm afraid the creature got away. I felt a surge of fear and anger. How could this have happened? How could a creature like that be roaming free in the National Park? Harold must have sensed my emotions because he quickly added, Don't worry, we'll take care of it. I've already reported the incident to my supervisor, and he's sending out a team to track and capture the creature. But as it turns out, the supervisor had different plans. He didn't want to call the police, because he feared that if the public found out about the creature, the National Park would be closed down. So instead, he tasked Harold with finding and killing the creature himself. Harold was reluctant to accept the mission, but he knew he had no choice. He was the only one with experience tracking the creature, and he couldn't let anyone else get hurt. 
So he went into the woods, armed with only a rifle and a determination to take down the monster. It was a cold and dark night when Harold finally caught sight of the creature. He raised his rifle, took aim, and fired. But the creature was fast and agile. It dodged the bullet and tackled Harold. The next morning, another ranger went to investigate and only found Harold's radio dispatcher. They searched for him, but they never found his body. It's been days since Harold went missing, and the creature still roams free. I can't help but think that I was the one who brought this curse upon us all. If I had only stayed on the trail, if I had only ignored the legends, Harold would still be alive. But now it's too late. The creature is out there, and it's hungry. I can only hope that the next person who crosses its path is luckier than I was. In 2012, I was driving through southern Utah with a friend, completely empty desert land surrounded by mountains, and both of us saw something, or several somethings, actually. They were running alongside the car, but we were faster at 80-ish miles per hour and left them behind. They were incredibly tall. My friend remembers them being tan-colored, but I thought they were more white, definitely not the color of any animal I know in the area. And by tall, I mean more than twice as tall as the car, or more so eight-plus feet. They were running on all fours right next to the road. Their legs were very thin and tall, and I remember seeing large ears on the top of the head like a bunny, but my friend doesn't remember that. I also think, since they reminded me so much of the rideable creatures in the dark crystal, my brain might have added the ears, but those are the closest comparisons I have to what I think we saw. Google dark crystal land striders if you want a comparison. We both saw them and freaked out to the point of us both screaming and we never knew what we had seen. Is there a known cryptid that looks like this or lives in this area? My story starts like this. I'm from the Navajo Nation Indian Reservation, in a small place located 30 south of Page, Arizona known as Bitter Springs. This event happened in March 2022 in the early hours of the morning at 2.45 a.m. When I was coming back from work in Las Vegas, I work in Las Vegas Monday through Thursday, and my route is usually traveling through Las Vegas to Kanab, then to back to Page, Arizona. I got into the town of Page, Arizona, coming back from Vegas around 3 a.m., and stopped at a gas station to fuel up and buy a snack to keep me awake. After that, I left the gas station, and I started traveling south towards Bitter Springs on Highway 89 that goes towards Flagstaff. I was the only vehicle traveling on that dark and secluded road. I have to admit that I was thinking about skinwalkers and a story that my grandma used to say when we were younger kids at her house. She used to say that she had seen a Yanoglushi or a skinwalker. Once before that, it followed her back to her house on the same route. I was going and kept bothering her when she tried to sleep. Just then, the rain began to start falling, and the clouds started to cover the bright moon above. As I approached a steep hill three miles before Bitter Springs, a vehicle passed me as it was making its way up the Bitter Springs Canyon oncoming. But as that vehicle passed me in the oncoming lane, I could just remember the light was so bright as if the driver forgot to dime his light as he approached me. Just as he passed, I seen a creature which looked like a man wearing a skin with a black and white face, with glowing eyes like a deer. The object couldn't have been a anything or creature of this world. As he crossed the road, I could remember that the creature looked right at me in my eyes. The creature's eye had made contact with me and gave a weird vibe. As it crossed the road, it then jumped over a fence on the side of the road and traveled quickly into the darkness. I then thought to myself, did I just see what I thought I had seen? I then proceeded in terror and hauled as going down the Bitter Springs Canyon. I never in my life traveled down the canyon at 80, 5 miles per hour, especially when it was raining. As soon as I got down the canyon, I turned off at the Bitter Springs housing and seen the creature again by the cattle guard. 
As I approached it, it took off to the south into the darkness. I then thought to myself, how the hell did that creature get to the turnoff before I did? Right then I knew this thing or creature was for sure a skinwalker following me. As I got to my driveway at my house, which was 1,000 feet from the turnoff, I ran inside and locked the door. About five minutes I heard banging at my window and heard a coyote howling, but the howling was off. It also had an awful smell like a dead rotten animal. Later, when the sun came up, I checked the surroundings of my house and seen coyote tracks around my house, which tracked back to the south. Hello, old Texas scare. I encountered something strange on my job. I work on an oil rig. My job is to run an excavator and mix off the mud that comes out of the ground and do stuff that needs big machine. Because of the locations of these rigs, I have to drive to pretty remote places in the wilderness of Canada. Anyhow, one of the light towers at the edge of the lease went out. I went over and in the forest I could see these weird like fireflies type of things, but like the size of a basketball. But they weren't bright, like they weren't lighting things up around them. Then I started feeling super uneasy. Then in between some trees I could see this big ass silhouette of a person with red glowing eyes. I ran back into the machine just to see it walking away. When I was in it I ended up telling the crew. I'm not the only one who's seen it. Like half of them have seen it and two of them have had it smile at them. WTF is this thing. Also, I'm so sorry for the punctuation. I saw the rake or something that I call the rake. I can't tell you what it was. I was driving late at night in the Rocky Mountains in Colorado. I live 30 miles south of Alamosa, Colorado. I was driving on a back road with my buddy taking him home near my house. It was about 12 a.m. Out of nowhere this thing appeared in the headlights in the middle of the road. It was crouching over some roadkill. It was humanoid. It was pale. It looked like it had no ears. It looked like a wendigo from until dawn looked like it was seven feet tall. Abnormally long arms. No ears. No nose and some nasty teeth. It wasn't skinny, but its skin was tight with ribs visible and like long claws on the end of its hands. I was barely able to dodge it with my truck as I was driving considerably fast. As I swerved around it, it seemed like time slowed down, and it looked up from the roadkill it was eating and stared at me as I passed. Its eyes were yellow. I immediately break and yell at my friend, what the F did you see that? His eyes were wide with fear and he, he nods at me. I throw the truck in reverse, but when I approach the roadkill it was gone, and he claims to have seen it too. So I know I'm not crazy. When I was a kid I read a lot of stories about the rake. I know the rake isn't real, so maybe they invented a creature that already existed. Maybe it's a cave creature like in The Descent. If you have any questions, please ask. I've been doing a lot of research. I want to find out what this is. I've been obsessed with him. I need answers. I won't stop looking for him. I was squirrel hunting on public hunting property in northwest Indiana, DNR, about an hour from my house. It is my habit to start my hunting early in the morning. I had never felt any pressure while hunting in this area or since the incident, so I thought nothing of hunting this day. It was fairly quiet except for the twittering of the occasional bird while I'd been there. It was after 11 a.m. when I decided to take a little break and have a snack from my pack so I took a seat along the trail. As I sat there, a voice came into my thoughts that said, Behind you, you preached to listen to your inner voice and trust it. I did. I turned around to look behind me. As soon as I got turned around, I saw an enormous being about nine feet tall and 1,000 pounds with long flowing reddish-brown hair all over his body that resembled an orangutan in color. I only saw it for one or two seconds because that is how long it took for it to stride across the trail opening. I got the impression that it didn't know or didn't care that I was there since it didn't look my way. 
I was about 120 yards away, just sitting on the side of the trail. I suddenly wanted to get the hell out of there, realizing that I was no longer the apex predator in those woods. The 22 semi-auto rifle I had would have done nothing more than piss off the creature and offered no more protection than a sharp pointy stick. I head back to my car looking over my shoulder, the entire time wondering if I was going to end up as a statistic. But I was not going to let this thing destroy my love for the woods. It took me a while, but I did make it back to those same woods. I now say at the very beginning of my hunts that I am only there to harvest a few squirrels and to enjoy the woods. I'm not there looking for them. I ask that they not scare me while I'm there. So far, that has been working. Does this offer credence to mind speak? I don't know. Did the Sasquatch let me know it was there, wanting me to see it? I don't know, but that is what I'm leaning toward. This event took place over a year ago, but I hadn't really thought to post about it until now. I don't want to dox myself, but I live in Maryland and I was with my now ex-girlfriend at her house. It was a rural area surrounded by woods in all directions. It was night and we were going to visit her grandparents' house a short drive away. We got into her car and while she was fiddling with her phone and the aux cord, I saw something in the brush illuminated by the headlights. It was tall, pale gray, thin, with a gaunt face and stretched limbs. I don't think it stood to the standard eight feet of a crawler, but my lack of depth perception makes it hard to accurately perceive distance and height. All it did was watch, its seemingly hollow eyes fixed to me. It was gone before I could point it out to my girlfriend, and I didn't have the bravery or stupidity to investigate. I wish I had concrete evidence of what I saw, but all I have is my word and a terrifying memory. I work in a pub. It's about two miles away in the next village. I usually finish work late, 1, 2 a.m., and I have to cycle home. The only route is a small road that goes through somewhat large woods. There's a one-mile stretch that has absolutely no street lights. It's pitch black. As I was cycling through the woods, I start hearing this screeching sound, similar to a small animal dying. It scared the shit out of me, so I started pedaling fast. I continued to hear it, and it seemed as it was progressing towards me. I use my phone's camera light to navigate, although it isn't impossible to see without it. I point my phone behind me and I swear I caught sight of some humanoid creature on all fours running at me. Call it mind games, but this was pretty vivid. I continue to cycle as fast as I can. I've been cycling long distances from a young age. I'd like to say I'm quite fast, yet I continue to hear the screeching and the light padding of the footsteps of whatever is chasing me. I try to turn my phone light off and... After a few seconds, I managed to do so. The padding becomes quieter, and I hear one last screech from whatever it was. I've never been so scared in all my life. Little background, I'm agnostic and pretty skeptical. I don't believe in really anything paranormal. But I was raised as a Jehovah's Witness, and the time of this story was during the late 80s, early 90s, mid-Satanic Panic era. There was a lot of circulated rumors about this or that being demonic, and you had to be careful about what you brought into your house lest you invite demons into your home. So I guess they're like vampires or bedbugs. Also, lots of urban legend stories. A lot of them involving Smurfs, like Smurf wallpaper, stomping newborns to death in their sleep and the like. Important to understand is that Jews don't believe in ghosts or aliens or anything else. But rather than discount the stories themselves altogether, they merely blame them on bored, vindictive demons messing with us because they've been banished to Earth. As they are fallen angels, oh, an interesting side note, Apparently, this eviction from heaven only happened in 1914. Not sure why God waited so long. Maybe it's like renter's protection. 
and he needed to give them tons of notice and a free month's rent or something, but I digress. So yeah, basically, if there was a J.W. Scooby-Doo cartoon, every ending would be the same. Now let's see who's really behind this. And they'd remove the rubber alien mask, the glowing ghost sheet, the dinosaur fossil. I knew it, just a regular old demon. Anyway, around nine, ten years old, I start being left home alone. Big family, so didn't happen much. But when it did, I started noticing things from the corner of my eye, around the edges of darkened corners. Only a couple of times did I notice a discernible shape, and it looked like this stuffed toy someone in the house had recently gotten. Black-furred, big-nosed, kinda goofy, yet terrifying in the right context. I guess think five nights at Freddy's style. Sometimes I'd get so freaked out I'd bolt out of the house with barely a jacket or shoes on and sit outside my house in the winter. I can't remember what excuse I gave when my family came home and found me shivering on the stoop, but I didn't tell them the truth. I even started to join my mom on painfully boring errands. Kids nowadays will likely fail to understand what hours of errands at the hair salon, dry cleaners, the bank or Fanny's fabrics is like without cell phones, or Nintendo switches. At best we had tiger handheld games, which were typically less fun than simply staring at your hands. But I endured it all rather than be left alone with the demons of zone. In retrospect, all of this is easily dismissed. Young man crammed full of the idea that the world is teeming with demons out to get him, is left alone for the first time in his life, and his mind conjures demons out of flickering shadows. But it's what comes next I can never hand wave away quite so easily. I'm about eleven-ish, I think, and I lose one of my last baby teeth. Maybe my last one I don't remember, but it's a molar. JWs famously don't celebrate anything but there is few things that weren't forbidden. I just don't remember if we did the tooth fairy thing. I mean, uh, no, there was no pretense of a fairy, just my mom taking my tooth and giving me a dollar. But I know I didn't get a dollar for this last one. Maybe it was too late in the game, being the last dish tooth and being the youngest of eight kids. The kid tooth market was now incredibly saturated. She probably had a coffee can full. Technically, she might have even qualified as an ivory dealer. So I go to bed that night, and I have an oddly specific memory of putting my tooth on my bedside table on the metal base of my lamp. I wake up sometime during the night, and it's full, deep, silent, scary night. Not my parents are still awake, and I can hear them watching MASH in the living room night. It's one of those half-awakes where your dreams are still a vivid reality and you can effortlessly step back into them. I'm instantly aware of a large, bluish-white glowing presence at the end of my bed. It's an angel with its back to me, focused on something else, which is odd in and of itself, as the only thing in that part of my room of interest was my Dick Tracy action figures. So hopefully he was bringing me the blank figure, because I couldn't find that shit anywhere. I don't remember if I could move, but I, I didn't. I was scared, but in an oddly detached, non-panicky sort of way. He became aware of me, and looked back, and not in a malevolent way, but not kindly either. It was more of a cold, slightly sneering indifference. Then I just fell back asleep which was obviously odd had it been someone innocuous like my mom in my room at 3 a.m., I doubt I'd have drifted back off so quickly, let alone a potentially fallen angel rooting through my collectibles. I loved those Dick Tracy toys, and I was very paranoid and protective about losing the Tommy guns on those things. It happened to a J.W. pal of mine. His mom took them all their weapons, and he was left with a bunch of squat, Lego-grip-handed, suited old men with stupid hats, and who wants to play with that? But I digress again. Then I just awoke in the morning, but I didn't immediately remember the previous night's visitor. I woke just like any other morning, sat up, but then paused during my crooked eye stretching as my rested on my molar, still on the lamp base, but it had been expertly cut in half. It was perfectly smooth like it had been done with a laser, and the other half was gone. 
I didn't immediately suspect my mother. Firstly, I doubted she had access to that level of technology, and second, if it was her, then where was my fifty cents? Only then did I recall the previous night's events, and as you can imagine, it shook me up. I mean, there was the spooky, paranormal aspects that would scare anyone. But atop all, it was the sheer randomness of it. Nothing added up to anything. It was just an absolute casserole of nonsense. Now had the demon angel burnt a cockeyed 666 on my wall and left a steaming cauldron stuffed with Smurf merchandise. Then okay, sure, I'd have been terrified, but at least it would have been on brand and fallen neatly into place with everything else I knew. But what the if did he want with half my tooth? I snatched up my half tooth and went to find my mother, not really expecting answers, but at least wanting someone else to acknowledge and share in this messed up situation. When I found her, I didn't editorialize or bring up any of the angel business, just handed it over with a hey look what happened to my tooth when I was asleep. She examined it closely, but far too briefly, and handed it back with something like, huh, that's kind of weird, hey, where's your father? Tell him breakfast is ready. Her lack of astonishment felt suspect. I went looking for my dad with the inner monologue of a TV detective. No, I don't think she did it, but she knows more than she's telling us. I didn't even bring it up to my dad as my relationship with him was fraught, and it felt unwise to do so. More than likely, I'd have been blamed for it in some way, and I'd be interrogated about my cola consumption. So I sat on this info. I think I tried to bring it up casually with my mom again later, but again got nothing. A week or so later, it was missing off my dresser. I thought I maybe knocked it off or something and it'd show up eventually, but it never did. Shortly after this incident, we moved to a new house and I never saw the flickering shadows demons again. I never had any more issues with being left alone in the house. As a skeptical adult looking back, I can say, look, I turned 12, I got over my fear of being home alone, and maybe I conjured the angel memory from nothing after that tooth incident, but that doesn't explain the tooth, and I remember the tooth. I could feel myself grasping for plausible scenarios. Maybe there's some medical test that requires an inner tooth test, so my parents took it. But then why not just tell me? Why return the other half? It's the whole issue with this incident. As even if you accept the existence of angels, demons, ghosts, or the chupacabra, it doesn't really explain anything meaningful. So yeah, that's it. I don't think about it often, but when I do, it still bothers me. So at the end of all of this, I just hope someone or something is waiting for me, and they have with them half my tooth and some goddamn answers. When I was younger, I used to go to a place called Desolation Wilderness near Camino, California. It was the perfect place for camping and fishing, realizing that it had been a few years since my last trip. I talked to a friend of mine to go camping and fishing. We managed to talk another friend into coming with us, and then we were off. We arrived around 1 p.m. and decided to hike upstream from a place called Wright's Lake, and then, when we found a good spot, we would set up camp. After walking for a couple hours, a ranger found us hiking and told us that we actually weren't even technically in desolation wilderness yet, and that we needed to keep hiking for a bit longer. I started tearing down the camp, but I guess the other two guys were not as enthusiastic about the trip as I was. They left for Placerville to find a hotel room. When he left, I uh, hiked up a bit farther, but I started to worry about the amount of time I had to find a place and set up my camp before dark. As I hiked, I tried to remember the ranger's instructions, but I ended up getting lost. Finally, I found a granite cliff with a stream that had a beautiful pool of water and was right on the tree line. I thought it was perfect, so I set up camp and started fishing. When the sun had set and the sky was dark, I decided to go to sleep. Cozy in my sleeping bag, I started to drift off, but then I heard something growl outside my tent. I grabbed the .45 compact handgun from its case and looked down through the screen on the front of the tent. 
From where I was standing, I could only see a dark figure that looked around four and a half feet tall standing near the trees. Thinking that it was a bear, I started yelling, hoping that I would scare it away. It didn't move. I then fired a shot at a dead tree nearby. That startled it and it ran back into the forest. But to my surprise, it didn't go very far. I clammed back into my tent. Then I heard crashing sounds. It was the sound of rocks falling off the cliff and hitting the pool below and the rocks around it. This was unnerving. I climbed out of my tent a few times, but I couldn't see anything, even though the moon was bright and the white granite rocks reflected its paleness. Crashing rocks hit every few minutes until around two in the morning. Then it stopped, but I heard something rustling just outside my tent. I yelled at it and tried to scare it off, but instead of scaring it, I heard a very deep growling sound in return. At this point, I didn't want to wait until it got too close. So I got out of my tent and looked around. Nothing. I decided to shoot the tree again to see if the creature would react, then run back into the forest again, just like the first time. But it stopped again. As I listened to the sounds of his moving, I realized that it was running on two feet. This was not a bear. I didn't want to go back into my tent. I grabbed my sleeping bag and moved over to the middle of the big slab of white granite nearby. I felt safer and knew the forest was further away from me, but I could still hear the noises of rocks crashing. I prayed the sun would come up soon. At about 4.30 in the morning, I was awoken from my light sleep. I looked back at the trees but didn't see anything. So I looked back over at my tent. There it was standing at the side of my tent. I panicked and picked up my gun and shot the side of the creature, but it didn't flinch. Then with giant steps it walked toward me. I shot at it. I wasn't sure if a point forty-five would even stop such a beast, but it was my only hope. After the second shot rang out, it was off into the trees. Shaking like a leaf, I sat down, clutching my gun. I waited for hours until the light started to appear in the sky. I broke camp and headed back down to Wright's Lake. That was also the last time I saw the creature. That was also the last time I went to the desolation wilderness, and I will never go back. To give some background, my family owns a trailer home which sits on a cliff overlooking Lake Kootenai in the south of the Canadian province of British Columbia. This trailer was used as a sort of a summer getaway destination as my parents and I visit for about a week or more each summer. The trailer itself is quite old. It was turned into a home by the previous owners in the 70s. But it's despite its age, it's still a very enjoyable place to experience the warmest months. The trailer sits in the middle of a cedar pine forest with a small clearing on the side facing away from the water to park vehicles, as well as a driveway connecting to the road which is about 110 feet away. The nearest town is roughly a 15-minute drive, and there are no neighbors. I sleep at the opposite end of the trailer, which I call the cabin, as there is an additional dining room and porch built onto the trailer, with a bed at the front end and mine at the very back. There are two windows next to where I sleep, with one facing parallel to the lake and the other towards the previously mentioned parking area. Due to the positioning of our cabin in a mountain valley around 9 p.m. in the summer, it gets very dark very quickly. Since we sometimes are outside after this time, there's a bright lamp mounted on the front end of the trailer which completely illuminates the porch area, facing the lake and partially lights the parking area, creating an orange glow that can get spooky, especially when raining. I hope the backstory wasn't too long, but it might help you get a sense of the surroundings. Around 11 p.m. one night, I was still awake, sitting in bed and reading. I keep blinds of the window facing away from the lake, open as to provide a little light for reading without having to turn on any inside lamps. The light momentarily gets dimmer, so I glance outside. What I saw was a large, almost glowing white creature which was moving through the semi-lit area, casting a shadow over my window. It had very long and spindly limbs, and I could see contours that looked like emaciated ribs on its side. It was hard to estimate a height because it was moving bent over in what I can only describe as a crawl. Just looking at it instilled so much fear that I couldn't look away. 
despite how much I wanted to. The creature moved at a fast walking pace from the front of the cabin and into the tree line. At the time, I wanted to believe that it was some form of very sick, hairless bear, as we frequently saw bears in the area. Looking back, the limbs were just too long to be a bear, and too skinny. Also, I would think a bear with mange would still have some hair or discolored skin, but this creature didn't. It appeared entirely to be a white color, and the light from the lamp reflected off its side, making it glow a little. I wish I could provide any form of evidence that what I saw really happened, but ultimately it's the reader's choice whether to believe me or not. When I have a moment, I'll draw a diagram to detail its movement in relation from where I was looking from. Last night, a party composed of 15 men and boys, all of them armed, set out in quest of the strange animal that is alleged to have its lair in a cavern along the Swatara Creek. The net result of the expedition is that one member of the party claims that he got a glimpse of the mysterious monster and fired a shot at it and missed. That is, he presumes that he failed to hit the beast as he claims that it shook its head savagely and ran away. Another member of the party verifies this story and says the animal disappeared in Adam Bolt's meadow. This morning another party comprising 20 men visited the vicinity of the cave while several were watching the place, a cry was heard, and the watchers turned and saw the creature bathing in the swatter a short distance south of where they were standing. Several shots were fired, but all were without effect. Members of this party described the creature as an animal weighing between 200 and 300 pounds, light in color, and having a sandy head. Mr. Malfair, a reputable citizen, asserts that he has seen the mysterious visitor running about in Mr. Rasp's meadow between the Swatara and the Quidapahilla. At one farm in the vicinity, heads of 23 chickens were found. Some lay the slaughter to the beast, and others say it would not take the bodies and leave the heads. Others claim that they have watched the cave on the Swatara and have seen nothing in the Swatara and have seen nothing in the shape of an animal in that vicinity except chipmunks. As I gazed out over the vast expanse of the Grand Canyon National Park, I couldn't help but feel awestruck by its sheer size and beauty. The towering cliffs, the winding Colorado River far below, and the rich red rock formations all around me were simply breathtaking. It was a peaceful moment, but my peace was shattered by a sudden blood-curdling scream that echoed through the canyon. I quickly realized that it was the cry of a park ranger in trouble. I ran towards the sound and soon spotted Ranger Lori lying on the ground, writhing in pain. She was being attacked by a massive furry creature, almost as tall as the trees around us. It was a Bigfoot or Sasquatch or whatever you want to call it. But I knew I was looking at something straight out of a horror movie. The beast was clearly angry, and its eyes locked onto me as I approached. It was clear that it was going to come after me next. I was terrified, but I had to act fast. I reached for my gun, but before I could even get it out of my holster, the creature lunged at me, its massive claws flashing in the sunlight. I dodged the first attack, but barely. It was like being hit by a freight train, and I was tossed aside like a rag doll. I tried to scramble away, but the creature was relentless. It came at me again and again, each blow knocking me farther and farther and farther away. Finally, I realized that there was no escaping it. I knew that I had to fight back, or I was going to die. I stood up and stared the creature in the eyes. It was a terrifying sight. But I gritted my teeth and prepared to face it head. On! I charged at it, trying to dodge its huge claws, and aimed my gun at its chest. The next few seconds were a blur of violence and chaos. The creature and I collided, and I managed to get a shot off, but it was too late. Its claws raked across my chest, and I fell to the ground, bleeding and gasping for air. The last thing I saw before I lost consciousness was the creature disappearing back into the woods, leaving me there to die. When I awoke, I was in a hospital bed. My wounds were severe, but somehow I had survived.
The doctors told me that they had found me just in time, and that I had been lucky to escape with my life. I was grateful to be alive, but the experience had left me deeply shaken. Over the following weeks, I pieced together what had happened. The Bigfoot was real, and it had attacked Ranger Lorry just as it had attacked me. But there was more to the story than that. I learned that there were others who had seen the creature, and who had even tried to capture it. And that was when I realized the truth. There was a conspiracy at work. Someone, somewhere, was covering up the existence of this creature. They didn't want people to know that Bigfoot was real, and that it was a danger to those who lived and worked in the park. Ranger Lorry had been betrayed, and so had I. We had been left to die, sacrificed for the sake of secrecy. It was a bitter pill to swallow, and one that still haunts me to this day. The Grand Canyon National Park is still a beautiful place, but now I see it through a different lens. It's a place where danger lurks in the shadows, and where secrets are kept at all costs. I don't know what the future holds, but one thing is certain. The memory of that terrible day will stay with me for the rest of my life. It was around one o'clock in the morning on a chilly pre-summer night. I'm pretty sure that it was early June, but it may have been late May. A friend of mine, whose name I'm not going to mention, and I were out looking for a good place to have a little campfire. He knew of a campgrounds outside of Marcola, so we headed out in that direction. We took a few of the logging roads, taking mostly right turns as we tried to find the spot that he had been to. This was pretty deep into regrown log wood. We finally reached our destination, a dead end about 20 feet in diameter. The location included bushes at the west, a 10 foot or so strip with no trees to the south, an embankment about 8 feet high to the north and the road we came on to the east. My friend had left his car lights on so we could see what we were doing. Nature was calling me at that moment so I started walking back the way we came. I didn't get 30 feet before I felt like this spot was really weird. I knew that something was watching me. I turned around and walked back to the car. I stood in the middle of the headlights for a few minutes and then started to help my friend try to build a fire out of wet sticks. When I stood up, I heard a low sound coming from behind the car west. I looked at my friend, who had also heard it. For a moment I thought it was the car, but cars don't make that kind of noise, which is very much indescribable. A moment later we heard the same noise in three of four hoots. My friend went along his business. I stood in front of the car, scared as hell. To the north I heard a bird make its song, at one o'clock in the morning. I then heard something to the south that sounded like the muffled conversation of a man and a woman. This was accompanied by a few low whistles. It was after I heard this that I noticed the sound of light footsteps coming from the north, barely audible, only I knew they had to be big, walking on moss or something. By that time, my friend and I were really freaked out. I jumped into the car. He put out the fire and suddenly looked to the east, looked back at me looking really scared. He jumped in and turned the key. Nothing happened. The car lights were still on. The battery was alive. Nothing was wrong with the car. He checked under the hood and his cylinder was fine. Three green lights for go. We had to push start the car. We drove straight out of that forest and never looked back. When we got to the main road, he shut his car off. It turned over and started the first try. We haven't gone back to that spot since then. As I patrolled the vast Everglades National Park, I marveled at the beauty of the marshlands and the exotic creatures that called it home. But as the sun began to set, a sense of unease settled over me. The park was beautiful, but it was also dangerous, filled with predators and hidden perils. I heard a strange sound coming from the deep woods, a sound that I couldn't quite place. It was almost like a low growl mixed with a high-pitched screech. I knew that I had to investigate, so I set out into the woods. The woods were dark and foreboding, with twisted vines and towering trees that seemed to loom over me like giants. 
As I pressed deeper into the forest, the sounds grew louder, and I felt a cold shiver run down my spine. And then out of nowhere, I was attacked by an unknown predator, a creature that was unlike anything I had ever seen before. It was tall and muscular, with long arms and legs covered in matted fur. Its eyes glowed with a fierce intelligence, and its teeth were razor sharp. I fought the creature with all my might, but it was too strong too fast. It knocked me to the ground, and then, just as suddenly as it had attacked me, it was gone. I tried to follow the creature to track it down, but it was as if it had vanished into thin air. It was like chasing a ghost through the tangled maze of the Everglades, and I felt a sense of frustration and desperation growing within me. Days turned into weeks, and the predator continued to haunt my dreams, a shadowy figure that lurked just beyond my reach. I knew that I had to find a way to stop it, to bring it to justice before it could hurt anyone else. And so I teamed up with a team of experts, and we set out into the heart of the Everglades, armed with the latest technology and the bravest hearts. We searched every inch of the park, but nothing. Nevertheless, I knew that the memory of that creature, that unknown predator lurking in the heart of the Everglades, would haunt me for the rest of my life. As we returned to civilization, the memory of the creature still fresh in my mind. I couldn't help but wonder, where had it come from? What had driven it to attack me, and who or what was it protecting? The more I thought about it, the more I realized that there was a dark underbelly to the Everglades, a side of the park that most people never saw. There were secrets lurking in the swamps and the marshes, secrets that were hidden from the prying eyes of tourists and park rangers alike. And as I delved deeper into those secrets, I began to uncover a web of crime and corruption that stretched all the way to the heart of the park. There were poachers and smugglers, drug dealers and black market traders, all using the Everglades as a cover for their illegal activities. I knew that I had to take action to fight back against the forces that threatened to destroy the park that I love. And so I rallied a group of like-minded individuals, park rangers and law enforcement officers, who were willing to stand up and fight for what was right. Together we waged a war against the criminal elements that threatened the Everglades, taking down poachers and smugglers, drug dealers and criminals of all stripes. It was a long and difficult battle, and we faced many challenges along the way, but in the end we emerged victorious. Today the Everglades National Park is a safer place, a haven for wildlife and visitors alike. And though I will never forget the terror that I felt on that fateful night, I am proud to have been a part of the team that helped to restore the park to its former glory. But I know that the battle is far from over, and that there will always be those who seek to exploit and destroy the natural world. And so, I will continue to fight to protect the parks and the wilderness that I hold so dear for as long as I am able. Hey everyone, I've sat on this one for a while because my friends and I can't decide what we heard and it is still confusing to this day. Two of my buddies and I were out hunting, as this throwaway's name implies, in southwest Idaho. We were less than half a mile from the Oregon border in the Oyehe Mountains. For those who have never seen southwest Idaho or east Oregon, it is high desert, so mostly dead grass and sagebrush in this area. No trees to speak of. Our plan was to head over after work on a Friday and stay the night to hunt in the morning, and it was kind of my bachelor trip. We had done some early drives out there before the season to scout and check migration patterns and figured staying the night out there would be best to catch this herd waking up to move. We had a late start because my friends got off a little later and we took a bit to get together and packed. In any case, we got out there after sundown about 7.30 or 7.45 p.m. local time, so we had to find a place to pull off in the dark. Eventually, we found a somewhat suitable spot near a stream that seemed decent for the night. We didn't have a fire or anything, so we just had a couple swigs of Jaeger to celebrate my upcoming marriage and were talking about our plans for the next day, who goes where and where we'll glass, etc. 
Sometime in the middle of the conversation, probably after only an hour or so of being parked, there was a really odd sound, so we all stopped to listen and heard it go again. It sounded like nothing I had heard before. It was a deep and almost nasally sounding me. Ah, uh, that got deeper and almost distorted as it went and dragged on for a couple seconds. It was the same sound as what made us stop and was followed by pure silence for what seemed like ten minutes. We had no firelight and very little moonlight, so it was near blackout conditions out there. We all had pistols on us and hunting rifles in the truck, but did not feel comfortable at that time. What finally broke the silence was what I could only write off as a frog, but it sounded exactly like one of those wood frog instruments just being scraped at varying speeds. This was coming from one spot on the other side of the creek, almost exactly opposite of where the first noise was. We decided at that point it wasn't worth staying up to drink, so we got in the tent and went to bed, and once the frog sound stopped, a few minutes later it was silence for the rest of the night. As we have talked about it for the past year or so, we had a couple theories. At first we thought it could have been a cow, but the weekend before and the next day we did not see any cattle. About a month before, there were free-roaming cattle that I assume were moved out because this area is hunted pretty frequently and the day we hunted was opening day. Also, it was close, maybe 30 yards. If it was a cow, it would have been way louder. The wood frog sound I thought could have actually been a frog, but in all my time in the surrounding areas I haven't heard only one frog sounding off, and never one that sounded like this, or one that was inconsistent like this. My initial thought was someone was out there messing with us, but they would have had to hike in a long ways with no light because it was a decent sized flat area we were in. We listened to audio of just about every odd deer and coyote sound, and nothing matched. If you guys have any ideas, let me know. It felt like the two were connected because of the proximity, but my mind tells me that can't be true. I don't remember the year, but I was in winter, I think like 2016 or around then. I had an experience with what can only be described as a droger or ghoul. Me and my friend drove past it in New England. It was on a dark street, but it gave the most horrible feeling. Near my old house where a lot of creepy stuff happened, paranormal stuff. The house was old and haunted. Stuff would move doorknobs, would turn, etc., but this was unrelated to the incident. Both me and my friend experienced it, and we were both like... Maybe it was just a person, but we both got this horrible sensation, and it just definitely wasn't. I was really sick at the time and got even sicker. Definitely felt malevolent to both of us, and we both found ourselves looking out the window that night with a feeling like it had followed us home. This took place at some point between 12 and 13.30 last night. For context, I'm a programmer and do most of my work on commission for U.S. clients, so I live pretty nocturnally. Finishing at around 12, I decided to go for a walk to get my head out of the programming mindset so I could actually get some sleep. It's midsummer here and there was a decent amount of moonlight, so this wasn't really outside my normal behavior. After walking for about 15 minutes, I reached the furthest street from my house, as I live in a very small town. This street runs along a large embankment, which is next to a biking track in a bit of forest that separates it from the river. As I got there, I turned right to loop back into town. This is when I actually saw the crawler. My first conclusion was that it was a horse, because it was standing on all fours in the middle of a paddock, and there are plenty of horses around this area. I quickly realized that it wasn't, though, once I noticed a small group of sheep huddled in the corner of the field, which allowed me to get a sense of scale. Once I understood what I was looking at, I quickly crouched down and tried to hide in a patch of tussock near the footpath, but it had already seen or heard me. It took a few alarmingly quick steps toward me, and I thought it might charge at me for a second, but it stopped just as fast and just sat there staring. After maybe ten minutes, it turned and sped off toward the river without making a sound. Once it was well and truly gone, I got up and began to head home again. 
but I backtracked instead of walking along the river road like I would usually. I'm pretty sure I saw it again out of the corner of my eye as I was turning the corner onto my street. Here are some things I noticed. It was actually a dull pink color, like overboiled meat, rather than pure gray. It had the same sunken dark pits for eyes that I see others describe. And at first I thought it had no mouth, but it actually seemed to have an overly large mouth and a lack of lips, making it appear mouthless. Rather than appearing emaciated or bony, it was weirdly smooth, and I couldn't see the outline of its ribs or anything. I put smooth in quotes because it was wrinkly, but not lumpy or bony. When it moved, it wasn't running on all fours. Instead, it ran on its feet and used its hands to steady itself on objects like fence posts and the ground if nothing else was around. It was mainly balanced on the balls of its feet, like a person squatting. My best guess as to its speed would be around 80. Based on how quickly it crossed the road, when it was near me, everything went dead quiet. And I don't mean just the animals, insects and stuff. Even the sounds of the river were basically inaudible, and I don't recall even hearing my own breathing. Anyone else heard of this? Buddy and I left camp in my rig to grab some firewood a couple miles down the road. We came around a corner and saw a sheep herder we'd met earlier, open rangeland, talking to a guy in the middle of the road. As we got closer, we could see the other guy had a pistol pointed in the face of the sheep herder. We throttled down to break up whatever was going on, but the guy with a gun took off when he saw us barreling down the road. The sheep herder didn't speak English from Peru working in the States to send money back to his family and was scared out of his mind. Him and his 500 sheep ended up camping with us that night where we shared dinner and tried to communicate with hand signals. I was a park ranger in the Ozarks and I loved the beauty of the mountains and the tranquility of the deep woods. The sun was setting, casting a warm golden light over the landscape as I received a distress call from a park visitor. They said that something strange was happening in the woods, and I knew that I had to check it out. As I drove my jeep through the dense forest, I could feel a sense of unease settle over me. The trees were tall and ancient, their branches reaching up to the sky like twisted fingers. The air was thick with the scent of pine and moss, and the rustling of leaves was the only sound that broke the silence. I arrived at the location of the distress call, and as I stepped out of my jeep, I heard a low growl. I spun around, my hand reaching for my flashlight, but I saw nothing. Suddenly, a figure leapt out of the shadows and attacked me, and I realized that I was facing a creature I had never seen before. It was a monster, a twisted, deformed thing with razor-sharp claws and glowing red eyes. I fought for my life, dodging and weaving as the creature attacked me again and again. I managed to grab my gun and shoot it, but it only made it angrier. It howled in rage and then disappeared into the woods. I was confused and frightened, and I had no idea what had just attacked me. I called for backup, and soon a team of rangers arrived to search the woods. But we found nothing, no sign of the creature, no trace of its attack. The only evidence was the torn fabric of my shirt and the bruises on my body. I knew that the Ozarks were full of mysteries and secrets, but I never imagined that there was something like this lurking in the woods. I was determined to find out what had attacked me and why, but I knew that I was facing a dangerous and deadly enemy. The woods had become a place of terror, and I was no longer sure if I was safe. Days passed, and a team of scientists and wildlife experts were brought in to investigate the strange creature. The woods were scoured for any signs of the monster, but there was no trace of it. As the days went by, more and more people began to report strange sightings and attacks, and it was clear that there was something dangerous and unpredictable in the woods. Some said that it was a monster, while others claimed that it was a ghost or a demon. I was still haunted by my encounter with the creature, and I felt a deep sense of responsibility to protect the park and its visitors. 
I knew that I had to find a way to stop the monster before it could hurt anyone else. So I began to do my own research, consulting with Native American elders and local hunters who had lived in the area for generations. They told me stories of a mysterious beast that was said to roam the Ozarks, a monster that was half man and half beast. They called it the Skookum, and it was said to be a creature of evil, with a thirst for human flesh. I was skeptical at first, but as I dug deeper I began to realize that there might be some truth to the legend. I pieced together the clues and finally I had a plan. I would lure the skookum out of hiding using myself as bait and then trap it once and for all. I set out into the woods armed with my wits and my courage and I waited for the monster to come. I could feel its presence, could hear its breathing in the darkness, and then with a roar it attacked. I fought the skookum with everything I had, and in that moment I knew that this was the fight of my life. The battle was long and brutal, but finally I was able to injure the monster. Unfortunately, Beast fled, and we never saw it again. In any case, the Ozarks were safe once again. I was hailed as a hero, but I knew that the real heroes were the people who had helped me, the people who had believed in me and given me the strength to face the monster. And though I was proud of what I had accomplished, I could never forget the fear and the darkness of that night when I faced the Skookum in the heart of the Ozarks. My fiancé and I hiked into some forest in Ontario. We had a friend drop us off at the side of an old logging road in the middle of nowhere, and we hiked into the woods due east. The road ran north or south, so basically all we had to do was, was stay due east hiking in and due west hiking out, and we would reach the road again for our rendezvous at a predetermined time a couple of days later. There are no natural predators this far south, such as bears or wolves, so for protection I only brought a K-bar knife and some bear spray in case coyotes took an interest in our two dogs that accompanied us. The logging road was no longer in use by any industry, and we had hiked into the woods a few kilometers, so the chances of running into another human were now. In addition, hunting is not permitted in the area, and there is no water nearby for fishing. There really wasn't any reason for anyone else to be out there in the middle of the woods that far off the road. No cell service, although I did bring a flare gun and multiple flares in case we ran into trouble to signal for help. No GPS, just a compass. We were careful hiking in and didn't do anything risky to avoid injuries in this remote place. It was early fall, but it was unseasonably cold, well below freezing. Lots of leaves on the ground and still on the trees, but no snow yet. We set up camp in some thick woods. You could barely see 50 feet away. The trees' bushes were so dense. We were totally isolated and felt completely safe. It was so cold and so dark at night, it was moonless and cloudy, that we went to bed early to stay warm. I'm a heavy sleeper and next thing I know, I'm awakened by my dog pawing at my face. It is pitch black and I can't even see him. I go to pet him, but something is wrong. As I touched him, I could feel his fur standing straight up and he was completely rigid, facing the door of the tent. He was clearly on guard and very alert. At first I assumed there was a woodland creature nearby, but I couldn't shake the feeling that something was wrong. That is unusual because I often camp alone no problem and am not easy spooked. My dog and I just stayed there frozen and alert for at least a couple of minutes. My fiancé and other dog were still asleep next to us. It was 3.30 a.m. I checked my phone after the incident. The fire was out. No moon. Complete blackness. Just as I was letting my guard down, I hear the most unexpected thing. A notification going off on a phone just outside of our tent, maybe 15, 20 feet away, and I see a faint glow. I hear a male voice mutter, Oh! F or something to that effect and hear them running through the leaves away from our tent. They were clearly smacking into tree branches, etc., and swearing as they did so. At this point, they turn on their flashlight as they run. 
and I can see the beam flailing wildly around in the woods, occasionally back onto our tent. The dogs start going ballistic. I grab my knife and look at my phone. It's 3.30 a.m. I screamed out, if you come back here, I'll blow your head off. I'm assuming he had a satellite phone or really good cell service to get a notification like that. The other weird thing was he fled deeper into the woods and nothingness, not west towards the logging road. Needless to say, we packed up in the cold and hiked back to the road, watching our backs the entire time. We just walked down the road towards far-off civilization until we ran into some other campers set up right next to the road, seven or eight kilometers away from where we came out of the woods. It was just after first light. They let us use their satellite phone and we called our friend to come pick us up a day early. Upon hearing our story, the campers decided they would pack up as well and get out of the area. Lesson learned. I do not camp in the wilderness anymore without a satellite phone and a 12 gauge. I am 16 years of age and it is 427. About an hour ago, I was mowing a friend of the family's lawn and kept noticing these rocks being thrown at me. I thought that the weed eater was hitting these rocks and didn't think much of it. Well, about two minutes later, I could smell this awful B.O. smell and thought I must really have bad B.O. So I checked and I couldn't smell anything and the rocks started to come back at me again, but this time I could hear laughter, but like a retarded person. I kept looking around to see if anyone was around messing with me, and nobody was there. So I just kept mowing and smelling that awful smell. Then the rocks started being thrown at me, and I looked over in the woods and trees and saw this huge creature behind a tree. My hair went straight up on end, and I ran like a bat out of hell. When I got to the door, I looked back, and it was running through the trees, and the trees and bushes were moving fast, like in Jurassic Park. I know it wasn't a bear. It was too tall, and no bear can run that fast on two legs, if they can run on two legs at all. It was about eight to nine feet tall. I was working early one morning on a Wednesday. At that time, I'd been a police officer for a little over ten years. I was in a good mood that morning because I was expecting some potentially good news about an upcoming promotion. In fact, everyone was in a good mood that morning. I was eager to do my job and go home to my family. My day changed dramatically when the phone rang, though. It was an old friend of mine, and she had called me directly. She sounded exhausted and a little incoherent. When I asked her what was going on, she explained that she hadn't been sleeping. We'll call her Megan for this story. Megan told me that she'd been waking up every night from sounds coming from the basement of her house. At first she assumed it was rats or skunks or something, but then she said the previous night the noises had gotten so loud that she was certain there was a person sleeping in her basement. Reports like that are never good to hear. It's a surprisingly common event where vagrants will break into someone's basement and live there for weeks on end stealing from them and causing all kinds of damage. The real danger is if someone gains access to the main house. Megan lived alone at the time, so I immediately agreed to come over and take a look. I wanted to make sure that whatever was happening in her basement would come to an end. She asked me to come later as she was going to work. It sounds odd, but she wanted me to hear what she was hearing. She said that the sounds never happened in the daytime. So if I came over at night, then perhaps I could catch the person, if it even was a person that was living in her basement. I agreed, but it left me feeling uneasy and concerned all day. That evening, she let me know when she was on her way home, and I went to meet her at her house. She offered to cook me dinner while we waited for the sounds to start back up. I was in an even better mood, as I had learned by that point that I'd gotten the promotion that I was after. So we had a little celebration. At around 10.30, I heard the first sound coming from downstairs. She stopped and told me to press my ear to the door. So I did. I could hear a fair amount of shuffling. It wasn't very clear what it was, but it was definitely too big to be a rat or a skunk. I told her that I was going to slowly open the door. But when I did, it made a loud sound that I could hear crashing in the basement. 
I ran down the stairs with my weapon drawn, but I stopped dead in my tracks when I switched the light on. What I found was what looked like a large nest of some kind. There were branches and feathers and dried leaves all piled together in the center of the room, and it stank like nothing I'd ever smelled before. The window was broken, so whoever it was had left. I told her to stay at my house for a few nights and then arranged for some trail cams to be put up in the basement so that we could catch whoever was down there and have sufficient evidence. After a few days, I went to retrieve the trail cams and watch the footage. Megan was sitting next to me at the time. What I saw completely blew my mind. A large animal with long, thin arms and legs climbed in through the window. It behaved similar to a large ape, only I'd never seen an ape like that before. It brought with it more items to add to the nest. I know for a fact that apes don't make nests. In fact, most animals of that size don't make nests. It walked on its two hind legs like a human, but was hunched over the entire time. It had a large rib cage and large ape-like hands, but I remember noting that it had no ears and seemed to have no color on its skin, apart from one large black spot on the back of its head. Megan was freaking out and asking me what to do. I had no answer, for I'd never encountered anything like that before. So I gave the footage to my superior. When he watched it, his eyes stretched wide. The next thing I knew, I had a non-disclosure agreement on my desk, and the footage was confiscated from my possession. Megan was also forced to sign so that she couldn't speak of it. She said that men with suits had come into her basement, and when they were done, there was nothing left, and her entire basement had been boarded up. She never really felt safe in her home, though, and wound up selling it a few months later. It was a sad day, as that home had been in her family for generations. But whatever security she once felt there had been stripped away by whatever creature had decided to nest there. I was a ranger in St. Louis County, Minnesota. The year was 2007. A man in our staff went missing during his lunch break. He was a husband and father. We sent a search party out to locate him. We searched the area for about a day or so, but he was nowhere to be found. We even made inquiries to other nearby towns, but they had no information. We assumed he had wandered away from the area and may have perished. The family of this man requested his remains be found and buried. We honored this request. We had several months go by, and we put this man behind us. Then a strange occurrence happened one early evening in the fall. I was out on patrol, running radar on the roads. I was about two miles north of town, which is a rural area. I was doing my rounds, and I spotted a pair of eyes in the ditch. I thought it was a fox or something. I stopped my vehicle, stepped out. I wasn't expecting what I saw next. A dark, shadowy figure became now visible. It was hunched over, finishing off a deer. This deer was a simple four-point buck. The thing had just been killed and was eating it. That's not all. I was shocked at what followed. It stood back up, this thing on two legs, walking upright. It looked me in the eyes and quickly disappeared. The eyes were blood red. I watched this thing walk off into a nearby creek and disappeared immediately. I went back to the office and called my boss and told him when I saw him. He told me to stay there until he could get there. So I sat there staying in the office while my boss and another ranger wrote down everything they could about what I had to say. They searched for a few hours but could not find anything. I was scared to go out on patrol the next few days. It only happened one or two more times after this, and even then, that's probably too much. I ended up seeing it again in the area where I first saw it. It never acted aggressive, but it was always in that area. The final time it was winter and there was about 12 inches of snow on the ground. I saw it again. This was the last time. I was relieved when the spring came and I did not have to patrol that section any longer. Now, before I end my story, let me quickly tell you why I included the first part about the man missing after lunch. I believe that his spirit became disembodied and turned into this horrible, ghastly apparition that I saw, or otherwise known as a Wendigo. I believe that it's possible that his spirit, or him dying, turned into this creature that I saw, 
Of course, this is just a wild theory, but I cling to it because it makes sense to me. I would love to hear any comments or thoughts or even theories on what they think. Do you believe that he turned into a Wendigo? Is it possible that he died and his spirit was able to manifest as this being? I don't know. I worked as a police officer in the town of Nakagoshi's for around eight years. I loved it there. A lot of people don't see why I enjoyed it so much, but that town had really brought me peace after many rough years. That peace was completely disrupted one day, though. There are many trails in Nakagoshi's. Most of them are completely tucked away in thick trees and brush. It was my day off, and walking those trails was one of my favorite things to do. At the time I had been divorced, I'm ashamed to admit that I wasn't a very good father in those years. I hadn't seen my children in years, and I had made very little effort to be part of their lives. It's a terrible thing to admit to, and I have many regrets, but that's the kind of man I was at the time. I had picked out my trail for the day. It was one that I hadn't walked yet, and I decided I'd go exploring. For some reason that day my children were on my mind, I remember that it bothered me because it made me feel guilty. It was kind of a bummer to feel that guilt on my day off. In hindsight, I was probably thinking about them because some part of me knew that I was in imminent danger. The first thing I noticed was that the trail was very quiet, seemed unusual. Normally, I'd come across at least one other person while on my walks. That day, I hadn't seen a single other soul. It didn't bother me too much, but it did tell me that I needed to be more vigilant for snakes and other dangerous creatures. I had stopped for a drink of water, and I was leaning against the wooden rail that lined the trail, when all of a sudden the hair on the back of my neck stood up. I hate that feeling so much. I don't really know why it happens to us, but it's never a good sign. I lowered my water bottle and listened carefully for any kinds of sound. I couldn't hear anything, but I couldn't shake the feeling that I was being watched. Suddenly the space around me felt way too quiet. I looked toward the direction I was going as I contemplated whether or not I should carry on with the trail or head back towards my car. I made the logical decision to head back towards my car. It wasn't far along the trail, so I knew it wouldn't take long to get to safety. As I walked, the only sound I could hear was the sound of my own footsteps, and it completely unsettled me. Then, something stopped me dead in my tracks. It was a light thudding sound, and it was coming from high up in the trees. I stopped to look. I scanned the trees, but heard and saw nothing. I decided to stay where I was for just a moment and listen. Then I heard the thought again, just to my left. It was as if something had landed in the tree. I looked up at the tree, which was covered in red and orange leaves. I focused hard on the leaves, searching for a large bird or maybe a squirrel. Then slow movement caught my eye. Something massive was stalking me. I couldn't see it clearly, but it had long limbs and it climbed through the branches sideways. It seemed to be keeping me in its sights as it moved gently through the leaves, barely rustling the branches. Then I saw part of its face. Two saucer-like eyes stared at me from between the branches. It seemed like minutes that we stared at each other. Not once did the creature blink. It seemed to be patiently waiting for me to look away. I was frozen with fear. I could hear nothing but the sound of my heart beating in my chest. Then seemingly out of nowhere, more hikers stumbled upon me. They were noisier than I was. They had a Bluetooth speaker that was pumping loud hip-hop music, and they were laughing and joking. It scared the creature away. It took off along the trees, moving faster than any animal I had seen before. Those other hikers will never know that their obnoxious behavior had saved my life that day. All I remember thinking was that I was going to die without ever seeing my children grow up. As soon as I got back to my car, I phoned my kids. That experience changed my life for the better. Still, I never want to be that scared again. It was a typical morning in Yellowstone National Park when the body of park ranger John was found. He had been on patrol the night before but never returned to his post. 
The other rangers searched for him and eventually found him in a remote area of the park. But something was off. John's skull was missing, and his body had been brutally attacked. My name is Jack, and I'm one of the park rangers. I was tasked with analyzing the body and trying to figure out what could have caused such a gruesome death. As I examined the wounds, I couldn't help but think that they looked like they had been made by a large, sharp claw. I couldn't shake the feeling that this was the work of a creature similar to Bigfoot. I shared my findings with the rest of the park rangers, but they mocked me and said I was just seeing things. They reported the case as a murder to the police, but they said they were too busy to investigate. I was left alone with a body, and I knew I had to find out the truth. I decided to take matters into my own hands and ventured into the woods. I wanted to see if I could find any clues or evidence that would support my theory. As I walked deeper into the forest, I heard a loud roar in the distance. I froze in place, unsure of what to do. But then I saw it. A creature, unlike anything I had ever seen before. It was covered in fur, had a large, sharp claw, and stood at least eight feet tall. The creature roared again, and a buck ran past me, panicked. I couldn't believe what I was seeing. It was like something out of a nightmare. The creature then fled into the woods, and I was left standing there, in shock. I knew I had to tell the others what I had seen, but I didn't know if they would believe me. I was terrified and didn't know what to do. I eventually made it back to the ranger station, and I told them everything. But they still didn't believe me. They thought I was just seeing things, or that I was losing my mind. I was left feeling alone and isolated. I knew there was a creature out there that had killed John, and I was the only one who knew about it. I couldn't shake the feeling that the creature was still out there watching me. I knew I had to be careful, and I couldn't let my guard down. I was determined to find the truth and bring justice for John. But I couldn't shake the feeling of dread that followed me, knowing that I was the only one who knew the true horror that lurked in the woods of Yellowstone National Park. I'm a Coast Guard, old Navy tug brought into service to the SDS Creeker had a ghost of a Navy guy who died in the bilge from gas. Fast forward to a new used mechanic trying to fix one of the batteries and wasn't getting it quite right. A guy on the batter next to him said, No, you do it like this, and unscrewed a part, showing him how it was done. However, the other guy was in a Navy uniform, and we were at sea. He diapered shortly after talking. Lots of us had seen that Navy engineer in the past, but that particular coast eye got off the boat at the next port call and refused to reboard. We left without him, not sure whatever happened, but he never came back to the ship. We also had the screams of a lady that would happen during late shifts, enough that we always turned the boats aft away from the direction of the screams in case it was a civilian in the water. No woman aboard this ship. We would light up that section of ocean with high-powered lighting, but there was never anything there. We were told not to log the events. One time we paddled into a backcountry site that we like camping at in the fall. It's high on a rocky cliff, but has natural stairs up, so it's nicely protected from the wind and damp of the lake. One day we were walking around in the woods behind the site just to see what we see. There are lots of open spaces caused by exposed rock that create a natural trail. We weren't even that far from the site. All of a sudden we hear a short, low growl. We freeze. Neither of us were sure we actually heard it. We wait a minute, see and hear nothing, so we start walking again. A longer growl. Now the hair is standing up on the back of my neck. My instinct is to run, but I don't want to activate some animal's prey drive. We still don't see anything. My husband picks up a big stick and starts hitting trees and making lots of noise so we seem big. We slowly back away and walk calmly back to our campsite. Needless to say, we didn't sleep much that night. We never saw what it was, but our theory is that it was a coyote. We often hear them howling and yipping near there, and I've read they sleep in the open during the day.
We pull into a state park campground to camp for a couple of nights. There was a line of trees separating our campsite from our neighbors, and our neighbors had a strap strung up between two of the trees with two blackened sausages hanging from hooks. Trying to ignore how weird that is, our neighbors greet us and say, Don't worry about the sausages. Our buddy got a trail camera, so we're trying to catch raccoons with it. Glossing over the fact that this trail cam was pointed right into our campsite, I definitely had to keep this in mind when I got out of my camper to pee in the middle of the night. The sausages were still there the next morning, but I think eventually a ranger came by and told them to cut it out because they disappeared sometime during the day. I didn't like the weird vibes emanating from that spot, so we just ignored their presence for the most part. They were gone for most of the day, but came back to their enormous RV and generator right as we were thinking it would be peacefully quiet for the rest of the evening. The last morning, I wake up to the sound of a thousand crows circling us. I lay there for a while and then peek out and see a dead crow lying right in the same precise spot below where those black sausages had been hanging the day before. Every crow within a 100-mile radius was circling overhead, angrily cawing out during this crow funeral. Now, I've been on the wrong side of a crow war before, so I wasn't too interested in any of them recognizing me. We packed up our camp as quickly as we could and hit the road. It took moving 1,000 miles away to finally feel comfortable enough to tell you this story. This happened just before my senior year of high school over a period of three weeks in the summer. I was 17 years old, drug-free and sober. At the most, I took Advil for headaches every now and again. I just want to assure you I was not on any mind-altering substances or long-term medication that could affect my cognitive ability. During the summer, my curfew was 11 p.m., and this occurred while driving home from my, at that time, boyfriend's house, which took roughly 15 minutes so let's say about 10, 45 at night. I was full of energy at this age and a night owl, so I was not even remotely tired. In fact, I was hyped up with a warm summer nighttime breeze, car windows down, singing along to the radio. I took a shortcut through back roads to avoid going into the tiny city with its jerk cops. Also, one of the roads I took was super straight and flat so I could really speed. And that feels great when you're a teenager. But right before that road, I had to take two very close turns to get onto it. First, I'd take a right turn that was more than 90 degrees almost back the way I had came. Then, in exactly half a mile, I would turn left onto the long, straight road where I could really put the gas pedal down. Since it was only half a mile, I normally didn't speed up that much because the small stretch of road was more like packed gravel than it would be a waste, as I would have to slow down again to turn left onto the much better road where I could let loose. The tiny property on the inside corner of the left turn is where all this went down. A house had recently been built there. Two stories within detached garage, and it seemed odd how quickly it had been erected as we built our family house, and it took us a year to finish it. I will start at the beginning because I believe this is all related. Week one. I am positively jamming to my music. The wind whipping through my car feels great and I'm relaxed in my very familiar drive home. I slow down to make my right turn onto the rough rural road, just be bopping along, when my lights illuminate something stunning sitting on the corner of the road. It's a wolf, a real wolf, a solid white real wolf. I know the difference in my dog breeds and a wolf. I love watching dog competitions, wildlife documentaries, and have even met a one-slash-fourth wolf in person. They looked different from domestic dogs. This was a wolf, and it was amazing and blowing my mind. I slow down even more while I turn down my music. I'm getting close to it, and I, I notice that it's not minding me at all. It is sitting perfectly still on the corner of the road, staring at the house. Almost unblinking, its ears didn't even flick towards me. All its attention was focused on this house. I was so close I could have reached out my window and brushed the fur on the back of its head. 
I was smiling and amazed, but my mind was already churning. It made no sense for a wolf to be behaving like that, even less for there to be a white wolf in rural North Alabama in the summer. I came to a complete stop behind it, marveling at its fur and presence. I felt euphoric, like I had seen something rare and blessed. My mind made a jump to the local Indian stories of animal spirit guardians, and I started to wonder. I couldn't stay, though. Mom would never believe me if I told her I was late because of a spirit wolf. With a sigh, I said goodbye to the wolf and drove home in a better mood than ever. I got to see something special, and it filled me with emotions of joy and peace. Week two. I was driving home again, and I had been taking extra care to keep an eye out for my wolfy buddy, hoping to see him again around that area, so I drove extra slow with my window down and radio off. That was a horrible mistake. I should have realized what the presence of a guardian meant. It meant danger. Alas, I was on the short road approaching the new little house. Then I saw the thing that to this very day makes me question my sanity. My reality and possibility of eldritch terrors, as Lovecraft described. It was crouched right before their mailbox, its limbs folded and pulled in tight with its hunched posture, yet its head was still taller than the box. It was mottled green and black with undertones of blue, and it looked wet and slimy all over. Its head was elongated, allowing for an extended maw full of razor-sharp teeth. The upper half of its body looked emaciated, with barely more than frog-like thin skin pulled over angular long bones, ropey muscles to hold it upright, and at the end of its grossly stretched arms were equally terrible long fingers. While its legs had bulked to them and looked equipped for running with back-facing knees for sprinting and tipped in raptor-like curved claws, it looked tall, maybe seven foot, maybe more, just folded up into this predator's posture, waiting for prey. Then there were its eyes solid black and sunken. I still want to vomit thinking about its eyes looking at me. Then I realized... It's going to look at me, it's going to see me, and there is no avoiding it. Panic, terror unique to this alien thing swallowed me instantly, feeling like I was tilting off the world I had always known and into an abyss where monsters like this exist. I couldn't breathe, but I had to get my window up. I had to get my window up or I'd be ripped by those teeth and torn with those claws. Blood would adorn the cabin of my car, and I would become an unsolved mystery. I had a manual crank window. F me, I had a crank window because I was scared of crashing into water and not being able to get out of my car. But now I realize that there were far worse things in the world than crashing into water. Its head was turning towards me, and I had let off the gas, but I was still getting closer to it. It made me want to scream, but I had to get my window up first, and I was cranking it as hard as I could. I was starting to cry as I finally got the window closed, and then I put my gas pedal to the floor. Gravel road be damned. I thought I must not look at it as I pass. I must not look at it or make direct eye contact. I just shouldn't. It's not good to connect with these things. I've already seen too much. My tires had found grip, and I started to launch forward, passing it. In my peripheral vision, I could see it starting to unfold its limbs, and it sent a terrible chill down my spine. I'm screwed. I'm really screwed. I'm really screwed. I was mumbling through my tears as I slid around the turn, fishtailing for a moment before I rocketed down the road. I felt sick. My heart was hammering. I had snot and tears rolling down my face, and my hands were shaking. I glanced in my rearview mirror and could only see darkness as there were no street lamps out there. I used a trick I've mentioned in one of my other stories to tap my brake soft enough the light comes on, but I don't actually slow down. Red lit up the dust that was billing up in my wake, but amidst the swirling chaos I thought I saw a darker shadow than the rest. I had enough and decided I was going to drive straight to the lighted roads and not let off the gas again the rest of the way. No more looking back. I was going to drive 100 nanium, which is as fast as I can go, before my governor kicks in. I even ran a stop sign at the end of the road because I was not going to get caught by this thing if I could help it. I took a right onto the highway and flew home. 
I might have even been relieved to get pulled over, but I did not. When I got home, no one was awake. I was pretty trusted to come home on time, so I called my boyfriend and cried to him for a long time before I was able to explain. He was dismissive and thought I was pulling a joke on him. Then he thought I was just being crazy and seeing things. There's many reasons we didn't stay together, but his insensitivity contributed. Week three. I refused to take my shortcut anymore. For that reason, I would have to leave my boyfriend's house a bit early, and he'd been making fun of me about it all week. One of the days we went to a park to walk around, and on the way back, he decided he wanted to drive by the house where I saw that thing. I was hysterical, begging him not to drive there, but he would not be dissuaded. So as we got closer, and I could not stop him, I leaned my passenger side seat all the way back and pulled myself down, cowering in panic of getting near the place. I hid below the window and covered my eyes while panting heavily, reliving the traumatic night in my mind again. At one point he stopped the car. Spooky, you have to see this, he said. Noah whined, resisting him, pulling at my arm. No, you really have to see this look, he said in a changed tone of astonishment. Tears in my eyes, I uncurled and slowly peeked over the rim of the window. The house was gone, burnt clear down to the foundation with only a handful of framing beams still standing. The ground around the house was blackened in a perfect large circle. My boyfriend started to get out of the car. I shouted to get out of here. Well, I grabbed for his arm, but he easily avoided me and got out. He walked around the ashy piles of the ruins for a bit, using a stick to poke at this and that. When he finally came back, he had an intense look of thinking on his face. There was no evidence of any personal belongings, furniture, power wiring, or even interior walls. It doesn't seem like other burnout houses. Something's weird. When we got to his house, he searched for news articles about any house fires in the area. There weren't any. He called the closest fire station and was quickly brushed off by the person that answered as they didn't know about a fire there and didn't have time to find out before quickly hanging up on him. I never wanted to see that place again. I went out of my way to avoid the roads in that area. Talking about it still makes my chest tighten, my skin crawl, and my eyes water. My brain still has trouble because I know I saw it, a thing that is nothing like any creature known to humans, yet still I saw it. If you've heard of something that matches its description, let me know. So when I was in high school, my friends and I were into really spooky shit that we had no business messing around with. We would visit cemeteries at night go to our small town's local haunt spot to try to stir up any urban legends but the story i'm about to tell made us quit cold turkey trying to seek out the paranormal one night we were over at our friend's century old home i mean it was old and creaky and the perfect setting for a night of oija we brought it out and for the first half hour nothing insane happened just some movement from the planchette then, feeling smug, I asked the spirits what my middle name was. The thing is, my middle name is literally made up by my parents. It's not a real name. No one in the circle knew, let alone, could spell my middle name. There was literally no way someone could even guess it. But the board knew. It spelled my middle name perfectly, and I could feel my heart fall into my gut. Keep in mind, my hands were not on the planchette, so I couldn't have moved it myself. Everyone laughed because what a silly middle name that would be. But I had to confess that it was mine, and the color drained from everyone's face. All of a sudden, a glass ashtray that was sitting a few feet away on the coffee table split clean in two, and we were done. We left the house to go stay somewhere else. I walk outside. It's the kind of dark when it's too early for morning still, but too late for night and it's freakishly quiet outside. I thought nothing of it at the time. Our trash cans were located on the side of the house in the backyard, halfway to the gate. If you stood at the side of my house looking towards the gate, you would see a hedge to the left of the gate that goes up to your waist. Across the street is another house with a driveway light installed. 
The light gives off that blaring white security light. Anyway, I get to the trash can to throw away the junk. When I look over towards the gate, that's when I saw it, whatever it was. I could only see the outline of it because the blaring white security light was in my eyes. But it was the most smooth and round head I've seen, which connected to very slouched shoulders. At first I didn't know what I was looking at, just an odd shape, the same height of the hedges. It wasn't until it moved silently and slowly towards the bottom of the hedge and to the neighbor's yard that I saw it looked headish. I was fourteen at the time and just stood there waiting for more movement or sound. After about one minute, yeah, I waited. Of not hearing anything, I sprint back towards the kitchen door. I don't know what it was or why it moved so silently, but it wasn't much longer before we moved out of that house due to strange things. But that's a story for another time, or at least another post. So to start off, I grew up on a small farm surrounded by forest. It's a small town below a major city in Appalachia. The first incident with this entity was probably when I was maybe 8-10, so 10-13 years ago. I was in my bedroom at home listening to music and playing. My window was open and it was evening getting dark, but I could still see outside. I noticed my dad walking by the window, stone-faced. I was going to say hello to him, but decided not to. Later, I mentioned to my mom that I saw Dad pass my window. She informs me that my dad wasn't home. In any way, my window was too high up for my dad to have been at that height. Mom decides it was probably a bear. We had a lot of hunting dogs that very often would freak out over nothing, but at the time of seeing what I thought was my dad, they weren't upset. I've mentioned this to my significant other before, and my friends and I were talking about our strangest moments, and significant other tells me to tell them that story, but then tells me he saw something similar when we were visiting my dad in his peripherals. He said it looked like a very tall person, but didn't see specific details, but that it walked past the large kitchen window. He meant to tell me earlier, but honestly forgot. It's really weird, and... I'm not sure what else to think about it, but since my significant other told me he saw it too, I've been trying to research what it might be. I've also just felt creeped out at the thought of going to my dad's again. I've had other weird experiences that I'm not sure what to think of, such as going hiking and finding small shacks in the middle of the woods that are my dad's property, then not finding them again and my mother calling me from outside while I was playing and telling me she heard screaming, thinking. It was me and couldn't see me in the yard and thought a wild animal could have grabbed me. Not sure if they're related, but figured I'd add that. I am a park ranger at a remote national park known for its dense forests and rugged wilderness. The peacefulness of the park is broken only by the sounds of the wildlife and the rustling of the leaves. But beneath the tranquil exterior lies a dark and dangerous secret that has been hidden deep within the park for years. One night as I was on patrol, I heard a strange guttural noise coming from the heart of the deep woods. Curiosity peaked. I decided to investigate, but what I encountered was far from what I expected. As I ventured deeper into the woods, I came face to face with a massive, unknown predator. Its fur was matted and its eyes glinted with a malevolent hunger. It was unlike any animal I had ever seen before. Before I could even reach for my radio, the creature attacked. I fought with all my might, using every ounce of my strength and training. It was a struggle for survival, with the unknown predator intent on taking me down. I thought I was done when another park ranger found us and then creature fled. I soon realized that what I had encountered was far more than just a wild animal. It was a dark mystery, something beyond my understanding, lurking in the heart of the park. And even now, as I look back on that fateful night, I can't help but shiver with a mix of fear and excitement. It was a cold and cloudy winter evening, and I had just woke up from a nice little power nap. 
I was tired as usual after every power nap, so I slowly got up and went to the kitchen to get something to eat. I got some food, heated it up, and went to go sit down and watch some YouTube. I sat down and found a video of Urban Legends on my home page. I was interested, so I clicked on it and watched it. It showed the usual goat man and moth man, but one urban legend caught my eye. A urban legend called the Orange Eyes. I was intrigued and watched it. The video creator said that it was a Bigfoot type creature. It was tall and had glowing orange eyes. But what I was really surprised about was it was a urban legend from my state. So after I heard that information, I searched up where it supposedly at and found that it was only a 15 minute drive from me. So like any other adventurous human, I hit up my friend and asked if he wanted to come with me and go look for it. He told me that he doesn't believe in that stuff and it was a waste of time, but I begged him and finally, after a couple of minutes, he agreed. I was really excited I got dressed and packed some flashlights because it was almost nine. After I was done packing up supplies, I got in my car and had to pick my friend up. When I got there, he didn't look too excited and said that he was tired. He got in the car and we were on our way. I told him the details and what the thing looked like, and he said that. There's no way the thing is real. I told him that it would be fun and that there's probably nothing out there. We got to the road that would take up straight to the area we could get out at to be closer to the forest entrance. While driving down the road, I couldn't help shake the feeling of being watched, but I tried to not notice the feeling and kept heading down to the entrance. We got to the entrance and I handed my buddy a flashlight because it was pitch black outside. I told him if he was ready and he said that he was good. So we start the nightmarish journey into the forest of the orange eyes. We walked for a good hour or so with nothing really happening. My buddy said that he was tired and wanted to go back home, but I told him let's stay for two more hours. He agreed and we continued walking. I couldn't shake off the feeling again of being watched. I told my friend if he felt the same way, and he said, yeah, ever since we turned onto the road that headed down here, I felt like I was being watched. We both were on edge now as we continued forward. Not too long after the feeling of being watched, we hear to our right something being snapped, like if someone or something stepped on a branch. We both jumped at the sound of it and pointed our flashlights over in the direction of the noise, but to our relief, it was just a little deer. We joked around with each other about who jumped more at the sound. We did this for a minute or two. We were in the middle of having a little argument when we heard heavy breathing coming from my left. We stopped arguing and listened closely to see if it was what we heard. We heard the heavy breathing like we thought we did. I didn't want to shine my light over there, so I tried to see if I could see anything. Thinking back to it, I wished I didn't look because what I saw would haunt me for the rest of my life. What I saw standing there behind a tree was ten-foot creature standing there with one of its eyes peering around the tree. And what shook me down to the core was that its eyes were orangish-red color. At this point, I wanted to pass out from fear, but I stopped that from happening. I looked at my buddy, and I could tell that he saw it too. I told him that we need to get out of here now before it's too late. We both agreed that we would take off at a dead sprint back to the car. I told him on three, we will go. I started to count, but I couldn't even get to two when felt a warm breath hit the back of my neck. At that point, I screamed, run. We kicked it into six gear and ran as fast as we could. As we were running, I heard the tree moving and felt the ground shaking. My lungs were burning from the thin, cold air. We ran for what felt like hours until we saw the car. I reached into my pocket for my car key and with one swift movement unlocked the car, opened the door, and turned the car on. I put the car in reverse so fast I felt like I could have been a stuntman for a racing movie. I hit the gas, flung the car around like an action movie. I put the car in drive and floored it down the road, never looking back once. Once we felt like we were a good distance away to ease up a bit, I asked my buddy if he was okay, and he said he was fine. All I did on the drive home was think about how close the creature was to me for me to feel its breath. 
I dropped my buddy off and told him to be safe and take care. When I got home, I took everything off, took a shower, and went to bed. The next morning was good. I felt like the day before was just a bad dream. But I realized really soon that it was real because the backpack that I had used to carry my stuff had a big slash in it, probably from the thing or a tree branch. From when we were running away, I called my friend to check if he was all right and continued my day after. By now, I've kind of gotten over it and my friend doesn't think of it anymore. From that experience, I don't want to go to a forest to hike or camp anymore. I hope you take something from this and learn to not be stupid like me and go out to a forest at night. Went for an afternoon hike once. At the top of the ridge line, I scrambled around a plateau of rocks to be on the other side facing another canyon and off the trail to smoke a tiny bowl. This is already a quite secluded trail. Maybe expect to see less than five people all day. It's like 12 noon and sunny. Nothing spooky slash special. Halfway through my bowl, my dog goes full razorback, rotwheeler healer mix, and loses her ever-loving mind deep dark growl, gets super skittish and won't go with me back around to the other side. I have to go ahead first and then command her to come past some invisible barrier. I think I even picked her up to get past a section of rock she refused to go past, but I wasn't going the other way around since I didn't know what was there to rain or otherwise. I've got goosebumps on every part of my body and my hair standing up on my arms the whole time. Now I'm high and adrenaline got me spooked and paranoid. Based on everything and where we are, I'm thinking mountain lion. I get back on the trail and nope the F down the mountain. Some two weeks previous, some transient teen with green hair had been reported missing in town and thought to have tried hiking with her dog, Wolfcast D. Mix, through the mountain range to a popular alpine lake on the leeward side. Her missing person poster was around town, and at the campsites down the canyon. Several days after my spook, they found her hanging from a tree just off the trail, and her wolf dog had been eating what he could reach of her leg slash torso. Don't know to this day if it was her sent to wolf dog that spooked my dog or a mountain lion, as I don't know exactly where they found her body, but it was somewhere close in the same area. But I'm so glad I wasn't the one to find her. High adrenaline pumping and on edge, dog razor-backed ready for war, coming around the corner to find a long green-haired corpse half-eaten by a dog and hanging from a tree would have been done. My wife and I were traveling to the Smoky Mountains from Ohio on an anniversary getaway. We usually avoid highways in our travels and instead prefer the scenic and slower-paced state routes of my childhood. This trip stood out as quite a disaster as we struggled with both the GPS and paper maps while navigating a route I was at least somewhat familiar with. Navigational errors are not our norm, and we quickly found ourselves having an uncharacteristic argument that got fairly heated but was nonsensical. It was like we spoke different languages and were looking at different maps. We eventually found ourselves in increasingly less populated areas and poorer road conditions. For those not familiar with the area being in central Kentucky, the forest is hilly and expansive, dotted with small towns and the occasional privately owned farm amidst all the federal land. We had eventually quieted down, anxiously following the GPS as it cut in and out. Our anxiety grew until the GPS suddenly chimed in with turn left now. I responded by reluctantly starting the turn when my wife suggested it must be a shortcut we were unaware of. Upon completing the turn, I slowed. Seeing the road took a sudden drop in quality. Potholes large enough to get a tire stuck in. Overgrown scrub growth on the edges and ominous gnarled vines hanging down. The hair stood up on my neck as it still does right now as I write it. Bringing the car to a stop, I asked my wife, Are you sure about this? As I looked towards her, No, we need to turn around, she starts to say, but is cut off, almost frozen, staring at her phone. 
not in the way a person freezes when terror sends their muscles trembling, but completely motionless. I instinctively slam it in reverse. Backing into the position, we came so that I could continue the course we were on. As we reached the end of our reverse turn, I slammed it into drive, but went nowhere as the rear of the early 2000s Lincoln is lifted off the ground. Before I can process what is happening, something charged from the woods to our right. At first, it was a large red blob that moved with a speed and grace that seemed unnatural to its grotesque nature. As it closed the gap, it was clear that it was running on all fours, but only partly so, its forward movement agile but uneven as it irregularly used its arms with its oddly bent hind legs. It was almost like its limbs were growing as it eventually came to stand on its hind legs and place its hands on the glass. Up close I could see what I thought was fur seemed more like strands of rotten flesh that grew as thick as a shaggy dog and smelled overwhelmingly of rotten fish and moss. Its hands looked nearly human were it not for the rotten fur and long claws. The face sticks with me as much as the smell, being somewhat shaped like a human that has its face twisted and pulled forward in vague canine shape, with large pointed ears toward the top of its head. Inside its snarling mouth were long, narrow teeth that looked almost too large to close. But the eyes were the worst part, bloodshot and yellow. They leered at my wife with a hunger, the kind of hunger that promises unspeakable things. When you're in a flight or fight situation, you usually get that distinct moment of clarity where you make your choice, even if it's one you're ashamed of. In that moment, I felt like a small dog defending my mate from a rabid wolf. I stomped the gas pedal and bellowed hard, Go now! And a series of loud noises that sounded more like barks than human noises. It jolted suddenly and the rear of the car drops leading to a loud peal out. It kept pace with us scratching at the car and banging on it until we broke 45 miles per hour, driving wildly through the winding country until we saw the lights of a town in the distance. We parked in a well-lit parking lot in the center of town next to a gas station. We busied ourselves as we inspected the car, reluctantly sharing what we thought we saw. She was in tears and sobbing about feeling a pressure in her head, and that she was conscious but paralyzed. Looking into the trunk, I spotted a cracked strut and a lump of the rotten flesh dangling from a frame member. The smell was still overpowering and sent us into a tear-filled hug as we stared at a piece of the filthy creature and realized it was likely at least two of them. The one in the window and the one that lifted the rear axle of the ground. Thoroughly shaken, we sat in the car facing opposite directions and discreetly unpacked our handguns and hid them under our blankets. We waited until nine or so before setting back off towards our destination via highway. On June 4, 2001, I stopped at a beach north of Brookings, Oregon for my usual evening walk with my golden retriever. When we crossed the creek near where it empties into the ocean, to get to the north and rugged end of the beach, my dog, who normally runs a block ahead of me, froze. She did not wish to walk anywhere in this area. We turned around and took a walk on the south beach. At 7.15 p.m., heading up the path to the parking lot, I happened to glance up at the steep hills on the north. I was stunned to see what appeared to be two very large men, both dressed completely in black. I looked again to determine if they were a threat to me, and saw they were, in fact, covered in black, and it probably wasn't dark clothing. The figures walked in a hunched-over posture, one right in front of the other, arms swinging like apes, and taking very long strides. They seemed to see me and appeared to be coming toward me. I started to run to my Chevy Blazer. Partway there, I turned to see if I was being pursued only to make eye contact with a large doe, perhaps less than 100 feet away. I did a 14er hike in October. I had a pair of combat boots, but they were summer boots and had very poor traction on ice. I knew this, so I went out and bought some yak tracks for the hike. They were absolute shit. 
They got snow stuck to them, so instead of my boots being rubber on ice, were ice on ice. In the whole hike, I slipped and fell fifty to one hundred times. The yacht tracks even began to fall apart a few miles in. By the time I got to around thirteen thousand feet, I noticed one was gone. That left me high in the snowy mountains with extra slippery boots. With the hardest part over, I made it to the summit. Then I had to descend with slippery boots and what was left of the yak track on one boot. I had to zigzag down a steep drop while following some footsteps of previous hikers. One slip in the wrong direction and I wasn't stopping for a long ways. I'm a 32-year-old lady from the very northern tip of West Virginia. Most of my life has been lived in Hancock County. When I was little, we camped in tents, walked everywhere, hiked at parks. All that outside goodness. In my teens, we started going to state parks to ride horses. I have been to Thomason Run, Beaver Creek State Park, Salt Fork, Raccoon Creek, and Vista Park, I think that was the name. We had a friend who was constantly inviting us to ride on people's land she had received permission from. I'm well acquainted with the local wildlife. I've seen all the major players, including core dogs and bears, and can identify most sounds in the forest. I love watching nature documentaries. I was looking to become a vet, so I studied a lot on animals. Drawing and painting them got me very acquainted with animal anatomy. Was I ever into cryptozoology? Yes, I was a Dino crazy little girl. My one babysitter had Reader's Digest Mysteries of the Unexplained. The thought of a plesiosaur in Scotland or an apatosaurus in the Congo was just mind-blowing. Later in life, I started looking at it like folklore. It was interesting to read the accounts and learn the theories behind what people were seeing. But I believed in them as much as a folklorist believes in dragons and trolls. I didn't have any interest in Bigfoot, and I'd never heard of Dogman. I never had interest in looking, nor did the thoughts ever cross my mind. It seems I didn't need to go looking. They found me. We moved to the farm when I was about ten. Mom's dream was to have horses, and she was finally able to live it. The farmhouse was haunted, mainly by the former residents of the house. I never felt threatened by them, though. It's a little unnerving to have two men talking and moving the couch you're sitting on. Or should I say it sounded like it? No one was home. No media was on. And yet I was hearing two men talking about how they were going to move the couch and where, and the sound of furniture being dragged right from under me. The land itself had its share of strangeness. Most things were benign, though. We just shrugged and carried on. I honestly hated our woods. Anywhere else, I'd freely hike. But even in the yard, sometimes I felt watched. Heck, sometimes I thought something was staring in our windows. Now that I think of it, we did have things slam into our trailer. I'd think it was a horse that had gotten loose. But when I'd go out to investigate, I'd find nothing. I'd chalk it up to a deer. I used my horse's breeds for their names rather than think up names for them. Anyone who knows me knew my horse's names. I was 18 to 19 in this encounter. By this time, we gave up on cows. I hate, hate them, and just had the horses and chickens. Someone knocked on the door at 2 a.m. I'd only been asleep two hours, but years of conditioning had my heart pumping and my mind clearing. Someone knocking that early meant trouble. It usually meant horses or livestock had gotten out. I wasn't disappointed. Our neighbor said the horses were in his yard. My mind wasn't totally awake, so I didn't think to ask which yard they were in. My stepfather came out, asked what was up, and told me they were my horses, so deal with it. Mom was working. That was nothing new. This lot of horses had three expert escape artists. I had the routine down. It was pretty dark out, but I did have some moonlight to help. The security light only went so far. Then, of course, it shut off after so long. When it was cloudy, you literally had to watch that you didn't walk off into the ravine. It was so pitch. I was naturally in a foul mood, cursing my horses and wondering if some drunk had gone through the fence. 
again. It happened a lot. As I got closer to the brown barn, I realized a horse was flipping out. It was running back and forth, squealing and carrying on. I went in and grabbed the halters and leads. I paused for a moment to see if any other horse or horses had replied to the horse I heard squeal. That would give me an idea where the other horse or horses might be. There was no reply. That was odd. I was thinking, crap, they're on the other side of the hill. It was the only reason in my mind they wouldn't be replying. Let's just say when they followed our cut trails to the other side, it took us an hour to traverse through the woods and lead them back. And even with two guys on a four-wheeler and my mom, that was a freaky trek. I felt like I was being watched and followed. Maybe it wasn't paranoia. So the land is set up like this. The brown barn was connected to a small pasture, about half an acre long which then connects to a seven-acre pasture. Pretty much in the center on the outside edge of the large pasture was an old white barn that we turned into a run-in. I decided to tackle the horse still in the fence so I could bring her down to the small pasture to keep her from escaping too. Maybe the others would follow. I had to walk clear to the other side of the pasture to get to the panicking horse. It was my mother's psycho Appaloosa mare. I tried to catch her and nearly got trampled a few times trying. She was frothing at the mouth and her eye whites were really showing. Was I alarmed? No, I, as I said, psycho. I noticed my other six were across the road. They were standing in a tiny little fence, an area under a spotlight. They were standing motionless and not touching a blade of grass. I was wondering how the neighbor managed to herd them into that tiny fenced-in area with that tiny door. Three of those horses were over sixteen hands tall. One was a draft horse cross. The doorway was actually small enough. He touched both sides going through. My thoroughbred mare took me two hours to corral. The last time she got out, much to my frustration, she was an awesome jumper. So a stranger rounding them up and putting them into a tiny yard was mind-blowing. I've had horses since I was nine. I'm 32 now. I've had ponies and horses. I've had Appaloosas, Arabians, draft horses, quarter horses, saddlebreds, thoroughbreds, mustangs, foals, geldings, that still thought they were stallions. I've had a lot of horses from all walks of life. I will tell you, they consistently do not like to be crammed into tight spaces, especially not in a group. I had two severely abused horses I was rehabbing a thoroughbred that actually had PTSD, and a racking horse that actually took me three years to touch without some sort of a bad reaction. They did not like being in stalls and all but one were mares. Maras are extremely moody and two of mine were particularly vicious to those they didn't like. My walker mare only liked three other horses. She should have been kicking the crap out of the others there. Man also didn't like to be under lights when they escaped. They avoided them like the plague. And not eating grass. That was over ankle deep. That was unheard of. They were silent and dead still. My neighbor came out and told me that they were like that when he found them. He asked me if I needed help, but I said no. My thoroughbred and racking horse mares did not like men. I told him I'd take them out, one at a time. I took one halter and lead and threw the rest outside the gate. I put the halter on my gelding and opened the gate to lead him out. They had other plans, though. All six came out as a freaking unit. They were literally chest to butt crammed together. My gelding and my Welsh mare had their chest pushing against me as we walked back to the brown barn. Normally, they did not do this. I wouldn't usually allow such bad behavior. We were on the main road, which I did not like. The speed limit is only 35, but people go 60. So I tried to lead them through the large pasture gate. They wouldn't even go on that side of the road, though. I was a little unnerved by their behavior. So I lead them down to the brown barn, and they went in. They were skittish, though, picking at the hay I threw out, walking around restlessly, sticking to the barn-like glue, and eyeing the upper pasture. I rationalize it by thinking, it's the atty flipping out that's unnerving them. And why hadn't she come down yet? She had to have seen us all walk down. 
I rushed to the gate between the little and big pastures out of habit. I didn't want the herd to go back out into the big pasture. And I didn't have to worry. They didn't follow me like they usually did. The gate was wide open, but the appy was still running and squealing back and forth in the same area. I started to go get her. Now the neighbor's security lights didn't really light up my pasture. The road was higher than my pasture, so it was cast in a shadow. I could make out her shape in some detail, though. She took off at a panic gallop, swerved sideways, and jumped the stream. When she landed, she nearly landed on her face. She caught herself, though, and took off at a dead gallop again. I ducked behind the stump. If she would have hit me, I would have been dead. I went back and chained the gate. I decided to forego looking her over until I got the halters and leads. She was too hot at the moment. I decided to walk on the road instead of through the pasture again. The pasture was uneven, unlit, and full of springs. Sometime during this, clouds had taken over the sky, so there was no moonlight to see by. The spot on the road where I was at was paved and pretty well lit, though my neighbor was paranoid as mentioned. I had almost gotten to the white barn when I got this sudden urge to stop and look at a very specific spot in the pasture. I would like to say it was instinct that told me to look, but usually I'd scan the woods first to see what was watching me. That's usually where the watchers are. Instead, I just flicked on my flashlight right on a certain spot. It was extremely close to where the mare was flipping out. I saw red eye shine. My first thought was, why in the world would a deer be there with all that chaws? I was feeling a sense of extreme dread and didn't know why. Besides, it being where my horse was going nuts told me something else just wasn't right. I then realized where the eyes were, relative to the walnut trees and my racing barrels. See, the road is above the pasture and the walnut trees were right at the same elevation as the road. The pasture itself is sloped to deal with the runoff from the road. The barrel it was next to was on the low end of the incline. The barrels were white so I could see a dim lighting from my flashlight on the one it was next to. This thing was too freaking big to be a deer. I was frozen standing there watching it. I just had this feeling it was evil and that I had to keep track of those eyes. It was watching me. It slowly blinked a few times. It also looked over into the woods above the pasture. I know you ask your guests if they ever feel there are other ones out there. Well, let me tell you, it, it crossed my mind. With a sinking stomach, I flashed my flashlight over the woods to see if I would catch eye shine. I didn't see any, though, so I went right back to the eyes. They were still there. I flicked back and forth, making sure nothing was sneaking up on me. I don't know how long I stood there watching Frozen. Someone could have come around the bend and hit me with their car. I was so focused. Finally, it started to move off. It glanced at me sideways a few times. Only one eye. I think it went into the copse of trees around the creek. I heard nothing. That wasn't surprising, though. The horses were still restless and making noises. I stood there a long time after, looking for eye shine. I was wondering if it could have been a bear. I didn't think so, though. The eyes were consistent in height until it disappeared. Bears are clumsy on their back legs. On this uneven, inclined ground, I have no doubt a bear would have dropped to the ground to go on all fours. Even the rear up and drop down behavior bears do when they're trying to see something wouldn't work. We had one cross our pasture before. He made a lot of noise going through the woods. The horses settled down quicker with a bear. I was almost to my neighbors at this point. I considered leaving the couple hundred dollars of tack at his house. Halters and leads aren't cheap. I had no doubt if I left them there, they'd be gone in the morning. My mother would be pissed. So I darted over, grabbed them, and ran like a bat out of hell. I know. I know. I should have left the tack. I also know you're not supposed to run, but I couldn't even conceive what I had just seen. I got into the barn, threw the tack down, and hung with the horses. I wasn't going to go back up that pitch-black driveway on foot. 
I figured with the horses I'd have a warning and the barn had plenty of sharp things. I didn't go back up until dawn. I was frozen stiff by that time. I've had years to think this over. It unnerves the crap out of me. How long was that thing there? Was that what was keeping the happy mare from coming down? Was it right there in the shadows while I was trying to catch her, or was it in the unlit barn? I walked through to get to the road. Was it the reason the epi swerved and nearly fell? How did my horses get out? I never did find how they got out. Did they panic and jump the fence? I did check the fence line away from the woods. I did look for tracks around the barrel. Sadly, the ground was hard from frost that morning. But I will say the happy mare was running for a good while. The ground was severely torn up and turned into a muddy mess. It was high noon when I went down there to check, and the ground had melted. I'll bet it was her that woke the neighbor up. It took them about a week to fully settle. I don't know if whatever it was was still in the area, or if they were that traumatized. It wasn't too long after that my mother filed for divorce. My ex-stepfather got the farm and I moved in with her in the city. Even with all of the weird crap going on there, there were none. Bipedal things going on, too. I miss it terribly. Maybe it's more accurate to say I miss the farm life rather than the actual place. I'd love to get back onto a farm again, but I'd probably hesitate to move back there. I never told anyone about the Ashine event. I didn't see the actual creature, and really, uh, how do you convey that unnatural horror-inducing feeling? You saw Ashine whoop dee do. My mother would have given me the benefit of the doubt, but my mother often told family members things. They made my life enough of a living hell. I didn't want to give them more ammo. This actually happened. I'm serious. The only reason why I even tell people is because my friend saw it with me and we still talk about it to this day. B-16 or 17 friend came by to tutor me in calculus about 10 p me at night. I let my friend drive my car to his house. He lived out in the outskirts of town where there's nothing but orchards of almonds. Passed by cattle ranch with lots of lights. Silence in the car. I'm on shotgun and I see a bull running on its two legs like a human. Bull turns its head towards us. Red glowing eyes, bull looks like it's getting ready to spin around, but then evaporates. Look towards my friend and ask him, did you see that? My friend replies, did it look like a bull running on two legs with red glowing eyes and then it disappeared? Yes, I saw that. Photo F that was about ten years ago. My coper came in his day off just to tell me that his friend saw the exact same thing six years after the incident. My ex didn't see anything. Was on cell phone. One hundred percent true story. Roller coaster. Appalachian trail. Nobody else at the shelter. Woke up early in the a.m. Watch it died. Used a stick to tell the time. But daylight savings or no. So I knew it was between 7 and 9 a.m. Started hiking out because my daughter was picking me up that day at a predetermined location. I didn't pass or see anyone that whole day. I started thinking I hadn't seen anyone the day prior either. And that didn't seem normal because the roller coaster section had been pretty well traveled. Anywho, my mind started messing with me, and I started to think that an emergency had happened in the world, and I was the only one left. Kept thinking I had to be close to the rendezvous point. Where is it, map? Gotta be close. Where is it? Then I hear a car horn way up the mountain beep three times. So I scramble for my whistle in three short bursts in response. I hear my daughter scream, Mom! And I look up, and she is running down the mountain, screaming, crying. I was late by five or six hours, and she was terrified. I broke down and bought a cell phone after that. This was about six years ago, so I held out pretty long anti-consumer. I think I just way overslipped and mind screwed myself. I was glad to have a cell phone on subsequent hikes, even if it didn't work everywhere. 
made me feel a bit safer about being a solo female traveler and gave my daughter peace of mind while I was gone. So I live in the rurals of Indiana, U.S. It's pretty stereotypical, a gravel road surrounded by cornfields, all that. It gets pretty spooky at times. Cornfields are creepy at night, and it always sounds like something is running through them. Dark, twisting shadows from trees in our yard. Occasionally weird animal calls. Yada, yada, yada. One time I forgot to feed the outside dogs during the afternoon, so I had to go out back and feed them, even though it was dark out. When I turned around, I, I swear I saw a figure lumber over the peak of the roof behind the chimney like it was hiding from me. It terrified me, and I sprinted back inside, which actually felt more scary considering I was running the direction of the thing I just thought I saw. But the real story comes from a few weeks before, and why that fleeting thought scared me so bad. So bit of backstory, my dog can best be described as a punk. He's a miniature schnauzer, but he thinks he's big and scary. He is fearless to a pretty stupid degree. We had a pack of coyotes walk through our empty field, and I had to sprint and tackle him to stop him from confronting the entire pack, growling and barking the whole way. Same story when he escaped the fence and went for a nearby neighbor's two angry boxers. So animals don't scare my stupid dog, and as I mentioned, he had gotten in the habit of escaping his fence. So one night, it's like 3 a.m., and he wakes me up and is whining and groaning and clearly has to go outside. Well, he had been escaping, and I hadn't fixed the fence, so I hooked a leash on him and went outside. The motion light came on, and I could see it's insanely foggy. The fog was so thick I could barely see the car in the drive, maybe 30 feet from where I was standing. So I was a little unsettled, but I take him out, and he does his business, and he starts sniffing around. And he kind of was whining, like he was smelling something weird, and he started circling and being agitated. Well, I thought I'd walk him through the yard to calm him down so I could go back to sleep. Well, like I said, he has never been scared of another animal, and his response to seeing anything is run up to it barking. But he stopped and focused hard, and his breathing started going really fast. But he was standing close by me, not pulling on the leash. I followed his gaze, and I saw this dark figure, bigger than a person, lumbering across the yard. It almost looked like a large person hunched over, maybe on four legs. Maybe not, bear-sized, but I've never ever seen a bear anywhere near here. Cornfields and towns between two cities is where I live. No bears. The fact that he was clearly scared and didn't want to engage this thing, mixed with I couldn't tell what it was at all. I ran back inside, and he very happily followed, and he sat down once inside and just looked up at me, whining like he was scared. Single most terrifying experience of my life. I was hiking miles deep into the backcountry valleys and the Society Islands when I came across a cabin that was 90% completed but the tools and generator and everything was still there. Only everything was covered in vines as if the builder had suddenly stopped for a lunch break and hadn't returned for years. Even a small radio with the on switch still on sat on a nightstand with the batteries and metal components rusting out. Next to it was a fantastic antique pocket knife that I decided to keep, passing up on the thousands of dollars of tools and other valuables as I made my way back towards the single-track path, I entered a clearing and was immediately circled by two wild dogs. They were greasy, dark black with wild yellow eyes and vicious, snarling teeth. I flipped out the knife as they began to lunge toward me, making small doves toward my legs. I swiped at one and aggressively stomped toward the other. This continued for twenty, thirty seconds, but felt like an eternity. Soon they slowly retreated as I became more and more pumped with adrenaline, making actual attempts to stab them by now. I yelled as loud as I could and stomped even more, and they finally retreated and scattered into the jungle.
We heard three loud whoops and a howl, almost like a dog, but different. None of our dogs barked, but were very still and quiet, which is unusual. The pattern repeated itself with variations for about two minutes. We thought it might be drunk graduates at first, but our friend who had left for a midnight four-wheel drive said no one was camped above us on the mountain. The next night, all the others in camp heard loud screams, but I was dead asleep. There were five children and four adults in camp both nights. We looked in the meadow and along the creek that runs through our camp spot, but never found any signs. Then again, we did not know what to look for besides footprints. None of us have ever heard the noises before, and some of us have been in the woods, camping frequently since childhood. We are all in our mid-thirties. We had all went to bed about two, three hours earlier after just talking around the campfire. We put all the kids to bed about 9.30 p.m. It was so loud it woke the kids up. It sounded very close. Out hiking the Wonderland Trail in 2012, my trailmate and I had an encounter with a rather standoffish park ranger who questioned us to a severe degree. After answering her questions to her satisfaction, she relaxed and informed us that there was a killer on the mountain, and they were trying to hunt this guy down. He'd already killed a park ranger and had taken food and supplies from other hikers. We had no idea this had been going on. The next few nights were sleepless. We never saw the guy, but we also have no idea if maybe he'd seen us. I went to Paradise on Mount Rainer and took a little bit of shrooms. I walked up to Panorama Point and just suddenly felt freezing cold, so I walked back down and made it back to my car. During the busy season, overflow, parking for paradise, goes to the picnic area. I was not capable of driving for about another hour. I opened Netflix and was going to watch some trailer park boys. There was a large family of about 40 Middle Eastern people having a picnic in front of my car. And the kids were running in, between the cars and playing. They kept putting their fingers where the door ends and the driver's side glass starts and peeking into my car and giggling and running away. Needless to say, I had to get out of there. So I took my bag and walked to a quiet spot and set up the hammock and watched the sunset. I was hiking alone once and on my way back after a peaceful and pleasant day when I just hit a wall. I wasn't tired, it was pure dread, like I was being watched and suddenly had a sense of not making progress, like my car, the trailhead, were no longer there. Also started to feel like if I stopped I would hear or see something that I wasn't supposed to, and the smell was just off. There is this certain smell in the northeast woods sometimes that smells like rotting uh, fermentation of plant matter. I want to say it's cattails maybe, but I don't think that's it. It's really hard to describe other than it's very distinct and sort of comes out of nowhere, especially in the summer and when the wood feel quiet. It's always made me afraid for some reason, which sounds stupid, but the smell just takes over everything and feels wrong like the normal, natural plants smell off because they are decomposing around the body. I was in the Mission Mountains in Montana hiking to a lake and not even a quarter mile in. I heard something in front of me. I looked up and saw the biggest brown ball I've seen. Lucky it was running away. You could hear this beast feet hitting the ground, thundering through the forest. I'm almost certain it could have been a grizzly because I saw a black bear in the area the day before and was no comparison to size. So anyway, I carried on to Lucifer Lake and on my way back walking in the dark, there was another animal that I could not see but ran across the trail behind me and stopped under a tree. I could hear it rustling around all aggressively and stop and... I could tell it was just staring at me in the dark. So I pulled the trusty point, 357, and bear spray out and got the F out of there. 
This was my first time to the lake and was by myself. Twenty fifteen. I was packing up camp in the Catalinas east of Tucson an hour or so after dark and all of a sudden the sky lights up and about one third of my field of view looking up was bright. It kind of seemed like there was a projectile at the center, but it was hard to tell what I was seeing. No cell service, so we weren't sure if Phoenix had been nuked or what else may have happened. It turned out to be a Titan. Missile launched from a submarine off the coast of California and it was very lightly reported at the time, and none of the scant few videos I've found, even ones filmed from California, no justice to what I saw. We weren't full-on panicked about what it was, but it was very unsettling to see. As a child in Wyoming, playing in a creek bed with my sisters and heard rustling in the bushes on the bank directly across from us, we look up just as a baby moose pokes its head out. We were savvy enough to know Mom was nearby, and a breath later she too pokes her head out of the bushes. She was so big, leaning out of the bushes, her neck and head spanned the creek bed. I do not remember running for the car, but my mom says she turned around to see what the fuss was, and all four of us and our dogs were back in the truck. Wonderful experience. Mom, Moose, and Baby were beautiful. But the mother was also huge and terrifying. I think my heart stopped until we were back in the car. I'm an avid hunter. I go every season, and I love it. More often than not, I don't kill any game, and I just love getting out and into the woods. I don't know if you're familiar with hunting season in Pennsylvania, but during late November, rifle season is in full swing. It was already the second week of the season, and I had yet to bag any deer, so I was eager to get to it early in the morning, and I did. I normally get up at around 5 a.m. and drive to my hunting spot. It's private land that my grandfather owns. Him and I are the only two that hunt on it, and the rest is posted to hunters. The only others on my land are employed on my grandfather's farm. I had originally planned on calling my grandfather when I woke up and asking him if he wanted to tag along. But the weather was more than horrendous in the morning. The snow was pouring down, and the wind was really strong. I love hunting in the snow, but it almost made me decide not to go, so I knew he wouldn't want to. The roads were really bad, so it took me a bit longer to drive there. Normally, the sun would be starting to rise by now. However, it was overcast and snowing. Regardless of the snow, I walked up to my spot. It was directly behind my grandfather's house, over a hill and back about a hundred to one hundred fifty yards. Almost immediately upon sitting in my spot, I hear things moving all around me. Honestly, I didn't pay too much attention to it. It could have been a number of things, but it was still pitch black, and the thought of it was kind of creeping me out. But there wasn't much I could do. It's not like I can shoot at anything, so I just ignored it and continued to wait. It wasn't much longer after that that I began hearing something walking just over the ridge to my right. At this point, there's barely enough light to see my feet, so even if it was a deer, it was still nothing I could do. However, I could tell it wasn't a deer. I just assumed it was my grandfather walking to his spots, which is just a short walk from mine, but the lights in the house were off, and if he was up here, I'm sure he'd let me know prior, even if it wasn't him. Well, it was a hunter. Albeit hunting illegally, I still wanted to let him know I was here. So I turned on my flashlight and pointed into his direction, flashing it several times. Again, even if it was a deer, I couldn't shoot it, so I felt it was better to be safe rather than sorry. Nothing happened after that, after I flashed my light. Then, though, he stopped, which was really odd. I didn't see them go back or hear them, so I figured they either sat down right there, after seeing my light, which was considered extremely rude, or I didn't hear them walk off. I just assumed it was the latter. An hour or so passes, and finally the first sights of daylight start to shine through. It's still snowing, and the snow was falling in entire snowballs rather than snowflakes, so visibility is pretty limited. 
Around this time, I noticed an odd-looking lump protruding from a group of trees, the shrubs atop the hill that separates me from my granddad's house, right where I had movement earlier. It looked like a mound of dirt. However, it was sticking out from the side of a tree, so obviously it wasn't hurt naturally. I raised my rifle to take a closer look. I could tell immediately that I was looking at the side of an older-style camouflaged coat. It took a minute, but it finally clicked. I was a person over there. I just thought it was a hunter, so I didn't know what to do about it. I knew if he was something on our land illegally, and from that I could see he wasn't wearing anything orange, which is required of all hunters during the rifle season. And I could tell just from looking that whoever this was wasn't my grandfather. I sat there for a minute debating my next move, but I decided to call my granddad at the risk of blowing his stunt if that was actually him over there. So without taking my eyes off the sky, I pulled up my phone and dialed his number. To my dismay, he picked up, and I told him what was going on. So he told me that he'd make his way up, but I decided on my own to give this guy a whistle, to let him know I see him. But he didn't react at all. After a few minutes, I started to walk up to this guy. After walking a short distance, I could clearly see this guy, who was sound asleep, tucked in between a shrub and a couple of trees. He obviously thought out here was a great place to lay down, as I would never be able to see him and his coat was not stuck out, and as I thought, he had no orange on. I gave him another whistle, much louder, and he woke right up. Almost immediately, he shuffled over to hide his exposed coat. He had a nasty, scruffy beard and a gray hat. Honestly, he looked like a harmless, old, homeless man, probably in his fifties. But he had a perfect view of my granddad's home from his spot and I had a pretty good idea of what he was planning to do once my granddad left. What's this guy realize he'd been caught, and he saw me, a six feet five madman carrying a rifle. He started freaking out. His face went pale and almost instantly. He tried to feed me some story about how he'd gotten lost during a drive with a group of other hunters. A drive where a coordinator pushed through a thicket in order to drive deer to hunters sitting at the edge of the designated driving area. However, the closest public game land is miles from the spot, so I knew it was a lie. He just wanted to keep on going on about how he was lost and how he fell asleep. He even went as far as to make up a fake name on the spot. I just stood there and listened, making sure he didn't give me any fishy movements. I couldn't help but think about what this guy was going to do to my grandfather if he had the chance. God knows, and the thoughts pissed me off. It was a beautiful day in Yosemite National Park. The sun was shining and the birds were singing. As I walked through the park, I couldn't help but feel a sense of peace and tranquility. I was the only one there, as it was a holiday and most people were at home with their families. I was a park ranger and my name is Jenny. My job was to make sure that everything was in order and that no one was in danger. As I walked through the park, I couldn't help but feel a sense of unease. It was as if something was watching me, following my every move. I shrugged it off, telling myself that it was just my imagination. But the feeling persisted, and I found myself looking over my shoulder more and more often. I decided to take a break and sit down on a nearby rock. As I sat there, I heard a rustling in the bushes behind me. I turned around, but there was nothing there. I told myself that it was probably just a small animal, but I couldn't shake the feeling that something was not right. I decided to continue my patrol, but now I was on high alert. I was constantly scanning the area, looking for any signs of danger. I came across a small cave and decided to take a look inside. As I walked in, I was hit with a strong, musty smell. I couldn't see much in the darkness, but I could hear something moving around in the back of the cave. I slowly made my way deeper into the cave, my heart pounding in my chest. As I reached the back of the cave, I saw a figure standing there. It was tall and thin with long, scraggly hair. Its eyes were black and empty, and its skin was a sickly pale color. I froze, unable to move or speak. The figure lunged at me. 
and I stumbled backwards, falling to the ground. I scrambled to my feet and ran out of the cave as fast as I could. I didn't stop running until I was back at the ranger station. I reported what had happened to my superiors, but they didn't believe me. They said that it was probably just my imagination and that I had let my fear get the best of me. But I knew what I had seen, and I couldn't shake the feeling that something was still out there watching me. I continued to work in the park, but I never went into that cave again. I never saw the figure again, but I always felt as if it was watching me, waiting for the right moment to strike. I couldn't shake the feeling of unease and fear, and eventually I had to leave my job as a park ranger. Years have passed, and I never talked about it again, but the memory of that day still haunts me. I still have nightmares about that figure in the cave. I still can't explain what I saw that day, but I know that it was real, and it was something that I will never forget. My boyfriend and I went backpacking in New Hampshire two years ago and saw a red light in the middle of the night, and to this day I still can't explain it. I've backpacked all over the world on my own and as a guide, and this is the only weird experience I've had that I, I simply can't explain. We slept in hammocks right next to each other and had gone off a random part of trail to camp further back in the woods, making sure we were far enough off trail to not be seen by anyone hiking by. It was fall and there was no trail to where we'd set up, so the ground was covered in twigs and crunchy leaves. Around midnight I wake up and see a red light shining on my rain tarp and just about shit my pants then and there. Waking up like that I went from zero to one hundred in terms of panic because I assumed someone was using the red light function on their headlamp to check out our campsite. I freeze and listen to try and not let whoever it is know I've woken up but the light fades within 15 seconds of me waking up. I try to wake up my boyfriend to not much avail because he's a heavy sleeper. I scramble out of my hammock like a bat out of hell with my own headlamp and look all around for anyone and give my best intimidating call out of who's there to absolutely nothing in reply. We would have heard someone walking away with all the leaf litter, but there was no sound at all. We were six, eight miles from our car. So our options were go back to sleep or try and hike six, eight miles in the dark to then drive home for four hours. We went back to sleep. At one point later in the night, my boyfriend said he'd woken and seen a flash of the red light as he'd woken up, but he didn't hear anything and just went back to sleep. It's creepy no matter what the explanation, and when I googled explanations for red lights in the woods, it took me to a bunch of Sasquatch forums, so I don't know, man. I wasn't able to find many similar stories to my own outside of the random hits from Sasquatch farms, so seeing yours made me really excited. I didn't camp for like a year and a half. After that experience, it scared me so bad. A friend and I saw something several years back. It was very thin, and its skin looked as if it had a full-body latex suit on. Very shiny, bone structure in its face, but no eyes or orifices. You could see the ribs. Head was elongated and fingers long and pointy. Had a peculiar looking gait to it. This was late at night and the creature was directly under a security light in my friend's backyard. We had been sitting quietly in his truck. This thing walked up not noticing us. Maybe 15 feet in front of us, directly under the security light. My friend screamed and it jumped and faced us. It then took off towards the woods. We had been gone for a while and just sitting in the driveway, chilling before we went in. We'd had to actually push the truck to the house because we had ran out of gas right before we got back to his house. We finally got brave enough to run into the house, but the door was locked and he didn't have a key because he never locked the house. Then we go around the house to try to get through his bedroom window only to find that it was open. Not only was it open, but the screen was wadded up and shredded on the ground. Anyone have any idea what this thing could have been? This was in 1996 or 97. I've never been able to figure it out. I woke up and climbed out of my rooftop tent. 
It's set up on a little motorcycle trailer I built with my dad, and below the tent is an awning for the camp kitchen. My truck was parked south of the trailer, or tent toward the road, and I walked north to the woods to pee first thing in the morning. I'm still groggy. I'm in my long underwear, and it's 6.15 a.m. As I walk back to my campsite, the only one on the hill, I see a man standing under the awning in my kitchen with two massive unleashed dogs at his side. I kept some distance and said, hey, can I help you? Well, I don't know what you mean by that, he replied. Immediately, there is an uncomfortable vibe with this older guy as he's just making himself right at home, poking around my kitchen, checking out my stove and whatnot. He has no reason to be in my camp, and it doesn't feel like a friendly hello from a neighbor walking his dogs. At the point of his stupid reply, he's an intruder, and he needs to leave. There's not much room to misunderstand my question, and I don't have a lot of patience in dealing with idiots or assholes, so I cut to the chase and ask him, What the hell are you doing in my kitchen? I don't know you, and if you don't know you, dogs, and if you don't need help, I need you to move out of my campsite. He starts going on how it's not really my campsite since it was National Forest. It is public land and he can walk his dogs where he pleases. He tells me I have nice stuff in the kitchen, how nice my motorcycle is, how I've been camped here for a while. At this point I'm more than annoyed and I said I know the time limits on how long I can be camped here. You're not Forest Service and it's not your business how long I'll be here. What stuff I have here? Anything like that. I'm asking you again to move out of my campsite. We argued over definitions of public in the context of a campsite. My campsite, which he felt totally free to nose through with his unleashed wolf bear dogs. Even at my second direct request, he was in no hurry to leave my camp and wanted to keep arguing. Basically, he had the grade school. It's a free country energy. He smugly says I'm free to walk here. I'm coming back here every morning, in this matter of fact way. I told him he'd be physically removed from my camp if that were to happen. My dog will bite you for doing something like that. I replied that sounds like a problem. The guy doubled down saying he will. I didn't feel the man himself was a physical threat, but he was highly argumentative and becoming increasingly agitated as was I and the restless dogs had me on high alert. They were certainly a physical threat, and he was threatening to sick his dogs on me. I was attacked by a dog as a kid and had a trauma response to strange dogs for years after. It was the only time I felt the need to hold my pistol while camping. I was standing with my motorcycle between us, ready to push 600 plus pounds of Bavarian machinery over onto him or his dogs if they approached. In my head I thought, oh, first push the bike, then go for the gun, then the road. I've got to get away from this guy or get him away from me. I said if that happens, I'm going to kick your dog's asses, and then I'm going to kick your ass. This is the part I wish I'd handled differently, but I was on high alert. People are free to do a lot of things out here in the National Forest. Many people camped out here have guns, and they come out here to shoot. Do you want to see my gun, or do you want to volf back to the road now? He finally turns to leave and says, have a nice day. Do me a favor and go for yourself. Don't come back to this campsite, was all I could think to reply. In October of 2021, I encountered what I believed to be an extraterrestrial inside my house, followed soon after by three other extraterrestrials in my house. It was a normal Friday evening at first. My dad, I was in college in Montana living with him at the time, had gone to sleep at about 10 p.m., and I stayed up until about 11.30. At 11.30, I turned off my TV and went to lay on my bed, where I promptly pulled out my phone and began browsing. This lasted for about 45 minutes before I finally decided to go to sleep. I realized that my throat felt a little dry, so I got up to get some water from the fridge. My room used to be a second living room off the kitchen, so there's no door on the frame, only a thick curtain. As I approached the curtain, everything was normal. It was just a normal night. 
The only thing that seemed a little off was how quiet it was. There were no crickets chirping outside, which there always were. I live in a secluded country ranch house, which was unusual. I could still hear my dad's white noisemaker in his bedroom, though. He uses it to help him sleep. It felt like a normal late night. I pulled the curtain aside to step out into the kitchen and experience the single most terrifying thing in my entire life. Behind the curtain was what I believed to be an extraterrestrial or alien. It was facing the hallway to my dad's room, and it was in a crouched position. We had a nightlight plugged in right above the kitchen countertop, so I assume it was trying to avoid that light. Its skin color was a sort of dark gray or gunmetal color. As I pulled the curtain all the way back, the alien turned its head sharply to look at me. I gasped and was immediately overcome by an immense sense of dread and terror. I was quite literally paralyzed by fear. I just stood there with my hand on the curtain, mouth agape. It stared at me for a couple of seconds, and then everything went black. I regained consciousness an hour later and was laying on top of my bed. The cover still made. My heart was pounding, and it felt like it was beating a million times a minute. I saw something on my left, which was the darkest part of my room, and had a door leading to our carport. Standing over my bed were three dark gray figures. They were tall, their heads nearly touching the seven-foot ceilings in my room. I turned my head, stared at them, and began to experience the same sense of terror as before. It was the exact same sense of dread and paralysis. I was unable to move, unable to speak, unable to do anything except look. This time they looked at me for much longer than a couple of seconds. It felt like it lasted a full minute or more. At the end of that minute, the being in the middle leaned in a little bit and moved its hand toward my foot. It tapped its finger on my foot three times slowly. Each time it tapped, a strange sensation pulsed through my body. It was just a weird energy that I can't really describe. After the third pulse subsided, the being stood straight again, and then everything went black again. I regained consciousness yet again a minute or two later, still on top of my bed, covers still made, and immediately began to cry. I don't mean just a tear or two, I mean that I was quite literally just bawling my eyes out for the next few minutes. Eventually all that emotion subsided and I grabbed my phone from my bedside table. It was 1.33 a.m. I didn't end up going to sleep at all that night. I just sort of sat there on my bed trying to explain to myself what just happened. In the years since this has happened, I have yet to come up with an explanation that doesn't involve aliens, demons, ghosts, or some sort of paranormal phenomenon. I thought of sleep paralysis at first, but I never went to sleep before I saw the first one. I was wide awake still when I went to get a drink of water. I wasn't dreaming because I hadn't yet gone to sleep. When the three came right after I thought that it could be sleep paralysis since I woke up on my bed and was unable to move or even scream when they looked at me. But how did I get in bed when the last thing I remember was looking at the first one in my kitchen? I know you hallucinate when experiencing sleep paralysis, but how did I see three distinct beings that essentially remained motionless? And what was that sensation whenever it tapped my foot? If it was sleep paralysis, I've never had it before, and I haven't had it since. If it was some sort of spontaneous mental breakdown, I've never had one before, and haven't had one since. If it was just some bad nightmare, when did I go from browsing Reddit and getting a drink of water to asleep and having a nightmare? Every time I think about it, I get an uneasy feeling just thinking about the dread I felt that night. It makes me feel squirmy and nervous. That night felt like death, but I don't know if whatever was in my house or whatever I imagined was malevolent. I don't know if they hurt me or did anything to me or my dad. I don't know if I was crazy, sleep deprived, or actually encountered aliens in my house. I've seen and felt some strange things before and after, including lost time. Seeing what I believe to be UFOs and animals on the ranch we live on being mutilated. The lost time thing was a little freaky. I was texting my brother about video games in the middle of the morning. 
I was in the middle of a response, laying on the bed in my room, when all of a sudden I was sitting on the couch in the first living room, opposite the kitchen to my bedroom. Seven whole hours had passed, and I didn't remember any of it. There were two texts from my brother, about an hour apart, the first of which was him asking if I got his text. Then the second was just a couple of question marks. I was confused and didn't really know what to do. The UFOs thing is self-explanatory. I've seen lights fly over my house at night. There's an airport about an hour away and I see planes on occasion, but these lights are always either too fast to be a plane, too slow to be a plane, or too quiet to be a low-flying helicopter. The animal mutilation thing is the saddest part for me. I have about ten outside cats or barn cats that I feed regularly and who keep away snakes, bugs, and whatnot. Most of them are spayed or neutered and vaccinated, but new ones show up still and get pregnant somehow. Every so often one of them gets killed, be it by a mountain lion, stray dog, coyote, or other cat. It's gruesome, but it happens. But there have been a couple in the past few months that have made no sense, and all have been the same way. A single cut down the middle of their bodies, running from their jaw all the way to their genitalia. The cut goes all the way through their sternum and everything. It's always perfectly straight and none of their internal organs or anything is damaged. It's like someone took a razor or something and slit them. We found them on our driveway in the private road leading to our driveway. There's never any blood and the cat is just dead on the ground already in rigor mortis. It makes no sense, and it makes me sad because I've raised most of those cats from kittens. The deep ocean is an eerie and mysterious place, a realm of darkness and void where few dare to venture. But as a sailor on a tanker, it is my home. I have spent countless nights staring out at the blackness, listening to the sounds of the sea and wondering what secrets lay hidden beneath its surface. It was on one such night that I heard an unusual screech. It was like nothing I had ever heard before, a haunting and terrifying sound that sent shivers down my spine. I turned to the captain, who was standing at the helm, and asked him if we could check it out. He nodded, and we turned the boat towards the sound. As we got closer, I could see something emerging from the darkness. At first, I thought it might be a dolphin, but as it came into view, I realized that it was something much more terrifying. It was a giant kraken, its tentacles writhing and wriggling in the water. It was an awe-inspiring and terrifying sight, and I could feel my heart pounding in my chest. The kraken was massive, its tentacles easily wrapping around the entire boat and shaking it violently. We were all terrified, and I could see the fear in the eyes of my fellow sailors. We ran inside the cabin, and we could hear the kraken screeching and howling outside. We were trapped, with no way to escape the clutches of the monster. I could feel my heart pounding in my chest, and I knew that we were in grave danger. For what felt like an eternity, we sat there in silence, listening to the sounds of the kraken outside. Finally, after what felt like an hour, the screeches and howls stopped, and we cautiously emerged from the cabin. The kraken was nowhere to be seen, and we could only assume that it had retreated back into the depths of the ocean. I checked my pulse to make sure I was still alive, and I couldn't believe that we had survived such a terrifying encounter. We sailed on, but the memory of that night stayed with me. I couldn't shake the image of the giant kraken and the feeling of terror that had washed over me. I knew that I would never forget that night. When I was in high school, few of us were camping out back of my buddy's farm out past the cornfields and some woods. We had our tent in a clearing in the woods. Beers, guns, hot dogs, you know the drill. Around midnight, sky opened up, and it was pouring harder than I've ever experienced. We called to the house for them to get us. Their truck got stuck in the mud and couldn't make it. They said to tough it out. Our tent was leaking like a sieve. We were in one of those big four-room tents, and two of the four rooms had about an inch of water in them. 
Next thing I know, tornado sirens are going off, and we can hear the tornado off in the distance. We were trying to decide if we stay put or go find somewhere to lay until it passes. Well, the twister spooked coyotes who came running and laid against our tent trying to get out of the rain, literally pressed up against the walls. No way in hell was I getting out now. So the four of us sat in the center room, clutching our guns and praying the tornado doesn't come to us. Never felt so happy to see a sunrise. I wasn't really camping per se, but in my travels I would sometimes have to sleep outside in the woods. One morning I woke up to the sound of something sniffing me, only to find a random dog trotting away from me. No big deal, right? Fast forward a few months and I'm in a new state in a new forest, and again I wake up to the sound of something sniffing me. In my head I thought I've experienced this before, just another dog. Nope. I peeked out of my sleeping bag only to find the mouth of a black bear right over my face. I slowly went back into my sleeping bag and prepared for the worst. Thankfully, the bear put his paw on my back and went on his way. I'll never forget them. Went backpacking with some friends in the North Gaia Mountains. Got to our site during day, hung out and chill. After it got dark, a buddy and I ran out of water and needed to hike back about 1,000 feet from our site to a waterfall to get some water. Halfway, we ran into a three-inch thick rope dangling from a branch about 30 feet up. We never saw that rope coming in, and this rope would be impossible to miss since it's right in the middle of the path. It was also sub-freezing temp and gay, so it makes it even less likely that there would be people just strolling about. We asked our third friend back at camp if he saw the rope coming in, and he didn't either. A few years ago, while camping with my bros for the summer after graduation, pandemic year, not fun, but we got to our campsite set everything up and got the tents up I paired with one of my friends. Occasionally he would get up to pee in the middle of the night. It usually woke me up, but not because he made a lot of noise getting up, but because he talked when he did. Literal nonsense sentences about nonsense. When I told him the next morning he didn't believe me saying he was as quiet as possible. Every time he went to pee, but I know he was talking because it was what woke me up every time. Maybe he was playing a joke, but it was still strange, and he denies it to this day. My wife and I were camping at Mount Lemon for our honeymoon, and it's the second night, and we'd gotten back late to our campsite after a day hike. It was dark, but had a good-sized fire going, and the Coleman lantern gave us a good amount of light in the immediate area, but pitch black not too far away from us. I'd just finished pulling the food off the fire and sat down while my wife was finishing getting dinner ready to eat, when all of a sudden I hear her let out a terrible scream behind me, like a fear-for-your-life scream. Immediately I'm on my feet, pistol almost about to clear the holster when I see the intruder. I didn't know we had skunks in Arizona. Camping on the side of Chattooga River after a quick storm. Just hung hammocks on the side of a cliff to get some sleep cause we weren't going to make it to the designated camping spot. There was no more light. I would normally be happy with the above, but this was the first time I've ever had coyotes making crazy noises very close. I was in my hammock two inches off the ground on a side of the cliff hearing coyotes laugh like witches for the first time. I've never heard coyotes quite like that since either. Blair Witch was in my mind trying to go to sleep. At first light, we were happy to get going. Designated campsite was twenty minutes paddle down the river. Past a rapid, we were glad to not go down at night, though. I'll never forget it. I think I might be able to take a coyote, but there was more than a few. I believe we camped next to a den, and they were not happy we were there. We all got a little bit of sleep, and the coyotes seemed to calm down eventually as well. Mostly, 
I often think if we had night vision game cameras, how many coyotes we would see walking around us at night, though. Camping in upstate New York last July with my husband, son, eight, and two nephews, ten, thirteen. Everyone else was in the tents getting ready to go to sleep. I was sitting next to the fire waiting for it to die down a bit more. It was just about sundown and we were in a spot about twenty yards off the main trail. All of a sudden, I hear a person singing coming down the trail. Later, my family said she was singing Kumbahaya, Spee, but I couldn't tell what song it was. It was just loud enough to hear it was definitely human and definitely singing. I listened as it got lightly louder as she approached, and then faded as she got farther away down the trail. I couldn't see anyone at all, and I wasn't about to go investigate. Super eerie. I convinced myself it was someone who was up on the ledges and started back down too late, so she was singing to herself to keep calm and warn off any animals. But I don't know. Serious hippie chick from a slasher movie vibes. The first time I heard a buck barking or grunting, it freaked me out. First of all, I didn't know deer made that noise. Secondly, I was in a wilderness area camping in an area where a large granite wall referred to as the Great Wall of N.C. was behind me. The noise bounced through the woods in a way I was not expecting. The next strangest thing I heard was the huge family that decided to set up camp right next to me later that same summer within another on wilderness area that is unrestricted campsites everywhere in it. They ended up being cool, but damn it was strange to hike in somewhere for eight miles, set up camp in a wilderness area by myself, and then end up having people right next to me, knowing full well how many other established wilderness campsites were there. I'd expect that closer to the trailhead, but usually once you hike in more than three miles, your fellow hikers or campers are also trying to get away from people. It was the second night of a canoe camping trip by myself. I was out in the middle of nowhere, thick forests surrounding me in all directions. About an hour after dark, I heard a little prop plane flying low up the river. It was a pitch black night, but I heard it circle overhead three times, take off upriver, and then there was a very loud crunch of metal and everything went silent. I later found out a two-seater plane had crashed into the shallow, rocky river upstream of my campsite. One survivor and one casualty. Based on the sound, I'd guess it happened less than a mile away. I live in the mountains, and I mean mountains. We get real dense fog to a point where if you're driving and it comes you can't see but five to ten feet in front of you. My cell moved here from out of state and got a job. One night she calls us and my husband has to go pick her up because she can't see to drive. I've experienced this my whole life though and never heard anything like that. That would be scary and I'm sure if you're not used to the fog it would be terrifying. I love it though. I used to go camping on the lake and get up real early just to watch the fog on the water. My dad and me were visiting my aunt and uncle at their house in the hollers of eastern Kentucky. It was getting late, but not dark, and it was very wet, rainy, and gloomy. We were going around this one curve about a mile out from their house, maybe a little less, and Suddenly, as we were going around the curve, this woman, I would have to say, in her teenage years, or maybe very early twenties, comes walking out from the deep woods on the right side, where my passenger side door is. She was wearing purple sweatshirt and black pants. She looked very disheveled and dirty, like she had been in the woods all night. As we passed, we just stood there and watched as we drove by, even watching us as we we're a couple feet up the road in the distance. If weird shit happens in the Appalachians, dude, this whole holler or hollers that my dad's family grew up in are filled with weird stories and hauntings and paranormal s.
an animal of some kind in distress. The woods were silent aside from the screams and screeches every five, ten seconds. The creature's voice seemed to constantly change, and it sounded like it was circling my campsite. At first I thought it was a bird of some kind, and then a bobcat or a mountain lion, then maybe a deer, and it went on for hours. Sometimes it would get further away, and I'd hear it echo over the canyons. Other times it sounded like it was just beyond the flashlight beam. It was terrifying. Something about it gave me a really, really bad feeling, and I refused to get out of the tent till the sun was up. This was on Mount Graham. I regard that mountain as one of the wildest places in southern Arizona. One day I was camping in the Kansas prairie, and a guy went missing and had to walk one whole mile before he found the next road. Most don't know this about Kansas, but many a camper have actually died out here, out of boredom. All jokes aside, I traveled to Montana and Colorado for camping trips. On one trip, I woke up from a sleep to the sound of a woman being murdered. No one else heard, but it could not have been more real. I think it was a mountain lion, perhaps. I've also heard owls make a similar noise. I work in a hospital in the sticks. A lot of weird shit happens there. A couple nights ago, I was dicking around killing time and walked up to the fourth floor. I was walking to the end of the hallway, and I heard a little girl say, Where are you? I turned around and looked up and down the hall and saw no one, and all the room doors were shut. I left and walked back to my part of the hospital over in the emergency room. As I was walking, I passed a doctor who had his ear cocked listening for something. I asked him what, and he said he thought he heard someone crying. I told him, don't tell me that, and mentioned another weird experience I've had a couple times where I've heard a knocking on the walls in the bathroom. He smiled and told me about a couple different areas of the hospital that weird shit happens in. Then he said, if you're ever over on the medical wing on the fourth floor, around room 446, and you hear a little girl say, where am I, or where are you? I advise you to turn around and just walk on out, he told me this literally ten minutes after I had just heard that on the fourth floor in the medical wing. I didn't pay any attention to the room numbers, but it was the hallway where that room is located. Hospitals are creepy as hell. I usually camp in the forest via car or hike out as opposed to field camping. I like being in the woods. One day, however, I got roped into field camping for May 24. It was a massive, mostly empty field with tents everywhere. Much like a festival, defiantly not my scene. On the way to a site, the random post we set up by, we passed a group with a full-blown DJ set up. I'm talking big speaking on stands and a canopy covering a DJ controller or mixer rig. They were blasting tunes, like blasting tunes. Now, for my taste, this destroyed the experience. I love concerts and loud music, but it's not why I go camping. It was a messy and less than ideal weekend. Oh, and to add a funny note, one guy at a neighboring site pegged his tent down with one peg. It ripped out and blew across the field. We saw him later, totally wasted in asking randoms if they'd seen his tent. Woke up to something sniffing my ear outside my tent while backpacking. I made some sort of weird gruffalo grumble. I was half awake and heard it run off through the brush. Another time, I was backpacking in my hammock and awoke to what sounded like ten coyotes cackling really close to me. Wasn't sure what they were up to. The funniest was car camping at a local state rest area with some friends. It wasn't too far from a cow pasture. I woke up in the dead of night to something just absolutely rummaging through a camp box. I laid there for a little listening to it and getting up the courage to poke my head out of the tent. All I could think was a cow wandered over and was destroying all our stuff. Finally poked my head out and it's one of the guys who was with us trying to start a fire because he got cold in the middle of the night. He was an idiot.
I was camping by the Yuba River outside of Sacramento, and I woke up in my tent to a bear trying to get into my car about 50 yards away. I clicked the lock button and got the horn to honk and scared it away. It came back five minutes later and bit a hole in one of my jugs of water I had sitting out. I made the horn honk a few more times and it ran off right past my tent. My dog was shaking like a rattlesnake tail. He was so scared. Appalachia, backpacking north of Asheville in April. Weather is predicted to be 40-50s at night and gorgeous during the day. Sweet. Post up night too with a beautiful view, snapping some sunset pics when the wind gets fierce. Temps start to drop. I have some layers, but I'm seeing my breath. Much cold. Get in my sleeping bag and I cannot warm up. Wind is howling like two gods colliding. As amazing as it was terrifying. Decide to pack my sleeping bag with anything that insulates. Get warm. Live. Backpacking a little west of Boone on a weird skimpy trail I found. Wasn't marked on the map, but thinking I'll find some cool views. Kinda smell something weird. Find a bend and see a shack. No worries. Just passing through. Scary man with a rifle comes out. Put my hands up. Said sorry, a little lost, and backed away. I was camping in high school with some friends at our usual backpacking spot. It's not on a map, but known to locals. Around 10 p.m. or so, another group came through, and then we told them we claimed this spot, but no one was down the trail at the less popular spot. They moved on but seemed ill-prepared to camp and looked more like a go-in-the-woods to drink and cut up. We all hopped in our bags for the night around 11 or so, around 2 a.m. We all wake up to this huge crashing sound. We were near a cliff sleeping under a big overhang and my immediate fear was huge rock must have fell. Adjusting eyes, I realized two young men were standing near our fire pit with a shotgun. I realized now they had fired it because they yelled, Everybody wake the F up! Everyone was silent and still. The men had no light, so they couldn't have seen us all. One of my friends was carrying a handgun, and we found out after he had it trained on this guy the entire time. But the rest of us were frozen. On brave friend of ours, now an ex-army ranger, Baydas. Go figure, turned on his light, binding the guy, and yelled, What do you want? After a little back and forth, it turned out they were with the other group showing up late and we're playing a prank on them. Think we were them. They eventually moved on to find the other group. But it didn't end there. About 3.30 a.m., two girls come walking through in flip-flops. Seven-mile hike to here in the middle of Tennessee mountains. Of course we can't sleep at all after the shotgun encounter and yell at them to keep walking. Craziest camping trip ever. So it was a group of guys. We went way back into the woods, walked for near an hour in deep Appalachian terrain. Lots of slick red clay. Lots of mosquitoes. We got to the spot and started set up. Right next to a bend in the creek, we cooked eight, made stupid jokes. Then we made a big fire and waited for night. Finally, night came. Conversation was calming, but no one was ready to bed down. Then I heard it. Off in the dark, the sound of two small girls giggling. I thought I had absolutely lost my mind. It kept repeating in uneven intervals. Even more worrisome, it kept bouncing from place to place in the woods. I resolved to say nothing and live in my insanity for the night. I was leaned up against a tree and held my machete close. Not that it would help. I was starting to spiral when my friend says, Okay, is no one else hearing that? I immediately ask him what he's hearing. He says it sounds like two little girls laughing in the woods. I've never been more freaked and happy at the same time. All of us but one that was trying to be the cool guy went into a frenzy talking about hearing the same thing but not wanting to sound crazy. We went out into the woods but found nothing. We decided to bed down around 3 a.m. Seven dudes in a giant tent. Not exactly ideal. We continued hearing the laughter and each one of us slowly trading conversation for unconsciousness. 
I was the last to fall asleep. I could barely cover my eyes until dawn. Daybreak is slow when you're under that much canopy and brush. We were all up and stirring a few hours later. We packed up, talked about the night, went home for a good shower and a nap. Tried to go back a few years later, but someone had bought the land and blocked it all off. Strange trails. Growing up in the mountains of North Georgia, camping and hiking were things me and my brother did so often it was second nature. So anytime Ryan and I had a break from school, we would head straight for the woods. We packed our gear, let our parents know where we were going, and that was that. No questions asked. We decided to camp about midways through Jack's River Trail in the Cohutta Wilderness, and it's a trail we knew fairly well, as we had used to a few times before, to practice long hikes. We arrived at the trail head around lunchtime, parked the car, got our gear out, and headed into the woods. We passed a few hikers as moved along and asked them how the trail looked, and the answer was always the same, wet. Jack's River Trail probably crossed the river 50 times as it went along its 17-mile-plus journey, and with the colder temperatures of late fall settling in it, was harder for the trail to stay dry. We moved deeper into the trail and started to look for a place to make camp. This is where Ryan and I made our first mistake. You see, Ryan and I have this rule. We don't camp near people if at all possible. Call us paranoid, but the last thing we want is for someone to drag us out of our tents and into the woods, never to be seen again. So we always camped a pretty decent ways off of the trail and in the area that wasn't popular with overnight camping. Roughly two and a half hours or so, we found what we thought was the perfect place to set up for the two nights that we would be out. We came up to Horseshoe Bend and ventured about half a mile off the trail into a clearing and set up. We built a teepee fire lay for that night and pitched our tents on either side. After setting up and unloading, we decided to walk back to the trail and go exploring around some of many swimming holes Jack's River had to offer. This was during Thanksgiving break, and I remember being surprised at how few people were on the trail. Maybe it was the weather or the fact that this was early in the week, but there didn't seem to be anyone hiking much, less staying the night. Around five o'clock, Ryan and I headed back to camp to start our fire, make dinner, and settle in for the night. As soon as the sun began to set, the cold rushed in. We added more wood to the fire, sat close and just enjoyed conversation. Ryan was two years behind me in school. I was a senior and he was a sophomore, but growing up we had always been close. We always hung out in the same groups, played the same sports, had the same hobbies, etc. Around nine we were settled comfortably around the fire. I had just texted our mom to let her know we were safe and getting ready for bed. And I remember we were talking about dreading going to our grandparents' house for Thanksgiving and having the same awkward conversations we had each year with family we only saw on holidays when things started to get strange. We were no stranger to sounds in the woods, and these woods were full of animals, from deer to black bears and even the random wild boar. If you were in the woods enough, you learned to distinguish certain sounds, and what we were hearing I can only chalk up to as odd. What Ryan and I heard was what sounded like someone sneaking around slowly just out of eyesight. With an animal walking on four legs, you hear a tighter group of steps, but what we were hearing sounded very distinct to what a human sounds like when walking slowly or trying to move without making much sound. I remember we both pulled out our flashlights and shone it in the direction we felt the sounds were coming from. But that is what was so weird. Whenever we would fix our lights on a spot we thought the sound were coming from the location of the sound, it would suddenly change. It was as if there were multiple people walking around us. That's when the whistling started. At first I thought it was the wind, and I remember thinking, maybe the wind is just throwing leaves around, and what we are hearing is nothing but the wilderness around us. Ryan looked at me and asked if I was hearing that. I didn't answer and was trying to focus hard on each individual sound. Two consecutive notes with roughly a three to four second gap 
and then two more consecutive notes over and over again. Ryan kept asking if I heard that and I put my finger to my lips, trying to keep him from talking. The fear I felt was incredible. My jaw was tight, my fist clenched, knowing I wasn't ready for whatever was out there, if it was anything at all. The whistling continued for what felt like forever, but thinking it through was maybe five minutes when Ryan finally yelled out into the darkness. Hey, quiet! The whistling stopped. The crunching of the wood stopped. Nothing. I was pissed. I looked at Ryan with a what-the-hell look, and he shrugged his shoulders. I had to do something, he said. I just shook my head. We sat there in silence for a few minutes when the woods erupted with noise. Something or someone was running in a circle around our campsite. The whistling came back. Two consecutive notes with the same three to four second gap and then two more consecutive notes. How could someone whistle this loudly without cracking while also running? I was done. I stood up shining my flashlight in all directions, trying to catch a glimpse of whatever was screwing with us. Nothing. It felt close enough to touch, but we never saw a thing. That's when the movement stopped, but the whistling was still constant. It was so loud, inhumanly loud. I looked at Ryan and told him to call the police. Now this is the part I will never forget. The part I never like to talk about. While Ryan was on the phone with the dispatcher and telling them our location and what was going on, I stepped around the fire towards my tent. Inside my bag, I had a six-inch fixed blade that I always carried and thought I would feel a bit more comfortable with it in my hand, more than just my flashlight. As I went to unzip my tent, trying to keep my eyes toward the woods, I heard some movement directly in front of me. I swept my light up in front of me, and for maybe two seconds I saw it. Whatever this person or thing was, it was about five feet up in a tree. Everything about it was long. Its arms, legs, neck, fingers, everything. And it was fast. As soon as the light hit it, launched backwards off of the tree. I heard it land, but it either jumped an impossible distance or landed in a thicket because I heard it, but never saw. I don't think I have ever yelled so loud. I ran back to where Ryan was and sat down. He kept asking me what I saw, but I couldn't answer. I just kept thinking about what I saw. Maybe ten minutes later, we saw a couple of flashlight beams coming through the woods, and about three guys came into view, asking if everything was okay. I settled a bit and started asking them if they had seen or heard anything. All they said was they heard a lot of movement and then heard my scream, and that's when they headed in our direction. I tried to explain what had happened without sounding crazy, but it didn't seem to work. One of the guys walked around a bit and came back and said he didn't see anything. Ryan told them that we called the police, and roughly 30 minutes later, a park ranger showed up. Ryan and I tried explaining everything to him, but he just chalked it up to either a curious animal or some campers trying to mess with us. Either way, Ryan and I decided we weren't staying the night. We packed our stuff up and walked out of the woods with the ranger. He took our statement and we got in our car and drove home. Ryan and I don't talk about what happened that night, but neither of us have been back to Jack's River Trail and will probably never go back. I was a park ranger in Yosemite National Park and have always been fascinated by the vast and wild landscape that surrounded me. There's just something about the deep woods, the sound of the wind howling through the trees, and the mystery of what might be lurking in the shadows that always put me on edge. One day I received a distress call from a group of campers who were lost deep in the woods. I was the closest ranger to their location, so I set out to find them. When I reached the campsite, I found the campers huddled together in fear. They told me that they had heard strange noises in the night and that they were certain that something was stalking them. I started to investigate, and as I walked deeper into the woods, I heard a growl that sent chills down my spine. I knew that I was not alone, and I also knew that I was dealing with something much larger and more dangerous than a mere bear. I soon realized that I was being followed by a Bigfoot, a cryptid that had been rumored to exist in the Yosemite wilderness for centuries. 
I tried to run, but the Bigfoot was too fast and too powerful. It caught up to me, and I was thrown to the ground with a violent force. I was sure that I was going to die, but somehow I managed to get back to my feet and fight back. I was able to use my park ranger training to fend off the Bigfoot, but it was a close call. I stumbled back to the campsite, where the campers were still huddled together in fear. I told them what had happened, and they were shocked. They didn't believe me at first, but when they saw the damage to my uniform and the terror in my eyes, they knew that I was telling the truth. We eventually made it back to civilization, but I was haunted by the encounter for months. I couldn't shake the feeling that I was being watched, and I was constantly on edge. I was also consumed by the mystery of what I had encountered in the Yosemite wilderness. I've had a few unsettling experiences in the woods, but this is unquestionably the strangest one. I've been mulling it over for years and still can't come up with a rational explanation. A few details have been changed to protect my identity, but the story is 100% true. I apologize for how long it is. In 2018, my partner and I drove up to a national forest in Oregon for a day hike in early summer. The area was somewhat remote, but nothing too isolated. Hiking is huge in the Pacific Northwest, so there are plenty of other people on these trails at any given time, especially during peak season. Because of this, we chose a less popular trail in the hopes of getting some all one time. It was an approximately six mile out and back, moderate difficulty hike with a waterfall at the end. It followed a river and didn't intersect with any other trails. Simple enough, right? We were both experienced hikers in good physical condition, so we had no reason to think we needed anything but day packs with a couple liters of water and sandwiches. Getting back before dark should have been a piece of cake. We set out sometime after noon. At first we took it slow and meandered around the riverbank for a few minutes. I found a cool animal bone and we mused over what it might be. It was clearly a vertebra from a large mammal, so we guessed it was probably a deer bone. Because I'm a little morbid and like collecting things of that nature, I put it in my pack. That might not have anything to do with what happened next, but I feel like I should mention it since it was out of the ordinary. The hike to the waterfall was beautiful. We passed a few other people on their way back to the trailhead, but for the most part, we had the place to ourselves. We stopped a few times to look at wildlife or take photos of flowers. I was tracking our progress on my Fitbit, so I always knew how many miles we'd traveled and how much time we had before sunset. We reached the waterfall at about 3.2 miles, which matched what the map had said. I paused my watch and we settled on a large boulder to rest and eat our lunch. Another young couple was there with their dog. We said hello and then minded our own business. Here's where everything went wrong. As we packed up our stuff and prepared to leave, my partner Michael slipped off the boulder and twisted his ankle badly. The other couple heard his surprise scream as he splashed into the water, so they rushed over to help. The three of us hauled him back to dry land and assessed the injury. None of us were doctors, but we thought it was a sprain. The swelling had already begun, and Michael said the pain was serious. He could barely stand. Upon realizing this, the male half of the couple started backing away and seemed anxious to leave. I asked him if he could go get help, but he didn't respond. Neither did his wife. They both just turned around and started booking it up the trail with the dog trotting behind them. I called out to them in frustration, but they didn't look back. Needless to say, we didn't have cell service that deep in the woods, so we couldn't contact anyone else. We had to hike back. It'll be okay. I said to Michael, it's only three miles. You can do this. We shifted the water bottles and our modest amount of gear into my pack so he wouldn't have to carry anything and made decent progress. I was still tracking the hike on my Fitbit. After about two miles, Michael ran out of steam and we rested again. I told him to lean on me to take the weight off his injured ankle. Even though I'm a head shorter than him, it seemed to help. We're almost there, I said just one more mile. Despite the setback, we were in pretty high spirits. The sun was still up and the woods were still beautiful. We made light of our predicament. 
Michael joked that he can't do anything without getting hurt or breaking something, and I comforted him. We both thought the ordeal was nearly over. Eventually, I realized we'd been walking longer than expected. I assumed it only felt that way because we were moving at a slower pace, but when I checked my watch and saw that we'd gone farther than a mile, I started to worry. We were at 6.6 .6 miles total. That meant the walk back to the trailhead was longer than the walk to the waterfall. That couldn't be right, but I figured I must have made a mistake at some point. Maybe I hadn't started the tracker until we'd already traveled away as at the beginning. Regardless, the parking lot had to be around the next curve in the trail. But it wasn't. We went another half a mile or so before stopping to assess the situation. Over seven total miles, and we still weren't back. What the hell? I checked the map of our hike on the Fitbit app and saw that there weren't any gaps. It was a straight line from beginning to end, with the line doubled back on itself, indicating that we were on the same route. But where was the trailhead? We talked it over and concluded that it had to be a glitch. Michael was adamant that we hadn't passed the trailhead and we couldn't have taken a wrong turn because there were no other trails. Plus, the scenery was all familiar. We saw things we remembered passing on our way to the waterfall. It was definitely the same trail and well-maintained, too. A big, wide dirt track that followed the river and didn't veer off into the undergrowth. Losing the trail was impossible. At that point, we started to feel demoralized. But what could we do except keep going? Our phone still didn't have service. Michael was in a lot of pain and struggled to put weight on his sprained ankle. It was twice the size of his other ankle. He was sweating. I was sweating. The whole thing started to feel like a nightmare. When we went another mile and still didn't reach the trailhead, we panicked. Night falls quickly in the forest and we had little daylight left. We were almost out of water, had no rain gear or other food, and the only flashlights were the ones on our phones. Of course, we cursed ourselves for not bringing more supplies, but we were only supposed to be out there for a few hours. It was just a short day hike, and we had no idea how it could have gone so wrong. Out of desperation, I yelled for help. We'd seen no people since that strange couple had abandoned us near the waterfall, but I was sure that we had to be close to the parking lot. That didn't mean there was anyone there, but we were both so freaked out. I was willing to make a fool of myself if it meant rescue. To our dismay, nobody answered. We were alone. In an attempt to get a grip, we reasoned that maybe we really had passed the trailhead we started at. Maybe we were so focused on keeping Michael off his bad foot that we'd simply missed it and were hiking toward the next trailhead. We were pretty sure that wasn't the case, but it was the only explanation that made sense. We were definitely still on the same trail, and though we couldn't be certain, it seemed like the landscape had changed. We no longer recognized any of the landmarks except the river, and that seemed to support our theory that we'd gone too far. We knew we weren't walking in circles. That wasn't possible. Should we turn back? We mulled that over for a few minutes. If we were wrong, backtracking would guarantee spending a night in the woods. Michael couldn't deal with that ankle forever. We decided to press onward. I'm not crazy, right? I asked. That initial hike was only three miles. We went three miles to the waterfall. Yes, Michael agreed. The entire hike was supposed to be a little over six miles out and back. We've walked a lot farther than that. We should have gotten back a long time ago. I don't understand what's happening. When night fell, we picked up the pace. Michael stopped leaning on me and limped down the trail as fast as he could. He later said adrenaline dulled the pain of his injury and gave him the motivation to continue. That part of Oregon is mountain lion country, and I'd just read about a lion attack a few weeks prior to our hike. Being caught out there in the dark was the absolute last thing we wanted, but there was nothing we could do about it. We were scared. Michael shone his phone light on the path ahead to make sure we didn't lose our footing, and I shone mine at the trees, scanning for cat eyes. I was crying. Fitbit said we'd hiked nine total miles. After 9.5 miles, we finally saw the sign for the trailhead and scrambled toward it. 
Relief didn't completely wash over me, though, because I expected we'd have to either hitchhike back to where we started or trudge along the side of the road for a few miles more. There was simply no way this could be the trailhead. It was three miles past where it should have been, as we climbed the short set of steps up to the parking lot, sweaty, thirsty, exhausted, and completely unnerved. I hoped to see a car. My prayers were answered, but it was my car. We were at the same trailhead. For a moment, Michael and I stared in shock. Our fear and misery were replaced by sheer confusion, and we just stood there. Then a twig snapped somewhere in the woods behind us and broke the spell. We hurried across the parking lot towards the car, and in those few seconds I felt an intense dread. The best way I can describe it is the feeling you get in a nightmare when something is pursuing you and you're trying to run away but moving in slow motion. Like your legs just won't cooperate and you know the thing chasing you is going to catch up. This is the only time in my life I've ever felt that way outside of a dream. We managed to pile into the vehicle and peel out of the lot. I was shaking. Michael was rambling about time distortion and dehydration and how we must have lost our bearings somehow. We got out of the national forest and onto the highway and it was a while before we encountered any other cars. I didn't fully relax until we made it back to civilization. Neither of us can figure out exactly what we experienced. Michael was on crutches for months following that incident and his ankle has never been the same. I still have the bone I found, but I keep it in a box because it gives me bad vibes. When we go hiking these days, we stick to the crowded trails. Whatever happened that day, we do not want it to ever happen again. A few years ago, a friend and I were camping near Squamish Valley River. It's usually a pretty busy spot but it was a weekday and we didn't see anybody at all on the road to the spot. And there was no one camped at the spot, so it was just us. Anyways, we were sitting out by the river on the sand watching the stars before bed. The moon was full and it was following the mountain line as the night went on and suddenly we both saw this bright flash in the sky. It almost looked like daylight for a second. I have no idea what it could have been. I thought maybe a shooting star out of the corner of our eye. But it was so bright and literally lit up everything. Still a mystery to us. It was deer hunting season and my friend had gone into Santium Lake with his pack mule the day before I went in on my horse to hunt deer for the weekend. It was misty raining on my ride in seven miles. I found his camp and set up my tent on the other side of the campfire from his tent. We looked around a little bit before dark and found somebody else's abandoned camp and picked up the trash they had left. They had also left a giant can of ravioli that was unopened, so we decided to eat it to spare the mule having to pack the extra weight. But we didn't eat it all, so we left it a few feet away from the campfire in the pot and went to bed. It quit raining and got clear and really cold. I could not sleep because my feet were freezing and, and I was so cold in my crappy sleeping bag. Sometime in the middle of the night I could hear the vibration of something with a heavy two-beat walk coming into camp. I didn't move a muscle because I was scared to death. It stopped right next to my tent and I could hear it breathing and soft growling, sounds and sniffing and smell it not three feet from me with just this wimpy, thin tent fabric between us. I was freaked. I could tell from the sound it was taller than my tent and it got closer like it had bent over for a closer look. I had my rifle right next to me and gripped it just in case it tried to eat me. My friend was sound asleep the whole time. It stood there for what seemed like forever but was only maybe a few minutes, then walked away and it broke branches as it left. The next morning I could still smell it really strong. I told my friend about it and he said it was probably just a bear, but I know it wasn't a bear. They don't walk any distance on two legs and a bear would have eaten the ravioli. I have never smelled anything like that creature before or since and my mom was a taxidermist for 30 years so I know what the various animals smell like.
I had just finished my tenth mile on a trail run through a narrow creek bed with vertical canyon walls on each side, without seeing a single soul. I was a couple miles out from the trail head when I came around a sharp turn and startled a big mountain lion. It froze momentarily, then jumped into the foliage just out of view. Behind me was about fifteen miles of trail to loop back to safety in our course. The sun had just set, and I wasn't carrying water or headlamp. My whole body started to tingle, and I started an all-out sprint forward towards the trailhead. I heard some branches cracking as I passed the spot where I had seen it and sent my legs into overdrive, only checking over my shoulder after a few hundred meters as I hit a couple bends in the trail. No sign of the cat. After a mile or so of an all-out sprint, I came around another sharp bend and almost leveled a female hiker squatting to pee. She screamed in surprise and fell over as I slowed to tell her what happened. She looked puzzled and in disbelief, so I continued the last mile to the trail ahead without seeing anyone else. My brother and two friends were hunting by Troy Orr. At 2 p.m., when they heard a loud scream that he described as like a cross between a man screaming bloody murder and a very pissed-off bear, the sound lasted eight minutes. It scared all three so bad that one of my brother's friends literally had to sit down and cry. Imagine that, all three men with high-powered rifles reduced down to little boys. My brother is the manliest man I know. He has hunted everything in God's creation, but even he was shook up. Now, my grandma used to take me camping when I was a child, and I did a girls' camp in the summer in the mountains when I was a preteen, where my friends and I would often wander off into the woods together. As a child, I played in the woods for hours with my brother. It was always fun and always felt safe and never eerie or creepy. Most of my time in the woods as a child and a teen was joyful, fun, and adventurous. I'd like to share another experience where a friend and I had a bad feeling. Others dismissed us, and there ended up being a reason why. When we were in our twenties, a friend of mine in D.C. organized a women's survivalist training camp for a group of our female friends, maybe seven, eight of us. I can't remember. I'd never been to West Virginia, but the land was beautiful and the roads were terrible. We had rented a cabin at a campground with multiple cabins on site, and during the day, our guide and teacher would take us out and teach us cool things like local medicinal plants or how to make rope out of milkweed. A West Virginian extended family was having a large family reunion at the same time, and two, three of their girls about elementary school age started hovering around our classes to be around the big girls, I assume, so cute, and they already knew most of what we were learning. We had a great time in the woods and on the land with no creepiness the first night nights. I can't remember. On the last night, the owner of the campground had a big bonfire with hot dogs and marshmallows to roast and cider, and everyone who was renting a cabin was invited. It was after dark, and it was either a long-ish walk or a short drive, but on the campground land, so my friend A and I decided to walk. We were having a nice walk and a nice chat when suddenly we got a bad feeling, and we both went quiet at the same time. We acted nonchalant, but glanced around to see what we could see. On our right was a cabin that looked deserted. It was totally dark, no lights on, no lantern out, but there was a single spot of light, the red embers of a cigarette burning. We could barely make out the figure of a man sitting there in the dark smoking. We stayed quiet, but picked up the pace. We checked in with each other once we approached the big house and were finally in the light of the bonfire. Was that creepy to you? Yes, that was creepy to us. Had we felt creepy before out here? No, we had felt calm and safe. The land hadn't ever felt creepy to us before, but the guy sitting in the dark had given off a terrible, menacing vibe, even twenty feet away, before we even saw him. 
We told some of our friends, and they just laughed it off and told us we had been afraid for no reason. It was perfectly safe here, they said. He was just another camper, probably with that West Virginian family. We were just paranoid, they said. Other than that, we had a great time at the bonfire chatting with other campers and with the owners, who were very nice. When it came time to call it a night, the owners offered to drive us back, and, uh, and I happily agreed, wanting to avoid another walk by that terrible cabin. We got back safely without incident, and the owners wished us good night. Now our cabin had two levels, the ground floor and a loft level. The ground floor was one big open room with a few beds, and if I recall correctly, a table and chairs and a fridge and maybe a stove. I was on the ground floor with about three other girls, and A was on the loft level with two, three other girls. I often have insomnia, and I did that night, so I just stayed awake in the dark while everyone else fell asleep around me. I was awake for hours just thinking my thoughts until I heard the crunch of gravel outside, like someone walking on it. I nudged my friend V, who was the closest person to me, via someone outside. V mumbled and told me it was just a deer and to go back to sleep. Okay, V was of no help. I got out of bed and crawled over to the window to see if I could see a deer outside, crunching on the gravel. I saw instead the red glow of a cigarette and could faintly make out the silhouettes of two men in the darkness. Now the cabins were not close together. They weren't far, but they weren't close. We were on a bend of the camp road where there weren't other cabins. The closest one was a short walk away, but it wasn't like running across the street or next door or next door or anything, and not visible behind trees and brush. Anyway, the closest cabin was far enough away that there was no reason for two guys to be smoking about 100 feet behind our cabin in the dark. I nudged V again. Best two guys out there. Shut up! It's a deer! Go to sleep! Now my boyfriend at the time had basically bought me all of our I.I. to go on this trip. Our guide had asked us to bring a large knife, and he had bought me a large hunting knife, but also a little camp hatchet. I don't know what I thought I'd be able to do with these, but I grabbed both and just huddled under the window in the dark, waiting. Suddenly a car alarm went off. All the cars were parked in front of the house. Groans came from the other girls. Shut your car alarm off. Whose car is that? It's not mine. I said, I think it's mine. Found the key fob and turned off the alarm. Silence. I sat in the dark and waited. Her car alarm went off again. The other girls lost it. I shut off your car alarm. I'm trying. She finally got it to shut off again. I crawled over to VV. There are guys out there and I think they're messing with us car. Shut up. It's just a deer. Go to bed and leave me alone. Okay, then. The car alarm went off again. Ah, shut off your car alarm? The other girls groaned. She did. The car alarm went off again. Ah, oh, what is wrong with your alarm? Go out and fix it. She turned it off. I'll go out there, but will someone go with me? I will, I said, and I'm turning the lantern on, so for your information. I came down the ladder. I went up to her and whispered, Ah, uh, there are men out there and no one will believe me. They keep saying it's just deer, but uh, I saw them smoking in the back. You can't go out there alone. I'm going to out first with a lantern so at least we can see around the cabin. We put our shoes on and I turned the lantern on and opened the door and walked onto the porch, lantern in my left hand, hatchet in my right. I hung the lantern up on a little hook on the porch. It was very bright and lit up the whole clearing in front of the cabin and the whole little parking lot for the cars. For the moment, at least, we couldn't see anyone there nor any deer. I tentatively walked down the front steps and walked around her locked car, trying the handles. No alarm went off as she tugged each one. She came back up the steps. Nothing. See, it wasn't a deer, I said. Even with you trying to get into your own car while it was locked, no alarm. Your alarm is not that sensitive. Someone was trying to break in. We went back into the house, locked the door behind us, turned off the lantern, and sat inside in the dark, waiting for our eyes to adjust. 
I told me she hadn't been able to sleep as well and had been laying awake in the dark up in the loft, feeling uneasy before the first alarm went off. I told her I wondered if someone had tried to lure her out there alone in the dark and had been spooked off when two of us came with both an extremely bright lantern and a hatchet. We stayed there together quietly chatting in the dark for hours, waiting to see if anything else would happen again. The car alarm did not go off again. Finally, enough time had passed that we decided to go to bed. The car alarm was quiet for the rest of the night. That was our last night there, so in the morning we packed up, and I drove back with a... If a zombie apocalypse were to ever happen, I'd pick a for my team, because she listened to her gut feeling and worked with me as a team to keep each other safe. I write this to encourage people to listen to their gut feelings out in the woods. It could keep you safe. Thanks for listening. Hope to see you tomorrow, son.